Okay. Good evening and welcome to the Carlisle Board of Selectmen meeting of Tuesday, January 29th, 2019. Um, we have a very full agenda tonight. Um, at 7 o'clock, we're starting off with community input. At 7.05, uh, we'll be uh, uh, discussing the appointment of the town facilities manager. At 7.25, the appointment of the finance director, treasurer, collector. 745, the Conservation Commission proposed revised job description for the assistant to the conservation administrator. At 8 o'clock, the citizens petition for town meeting warrant uh, regarding nitrogen loading credits for 2123 Bedford Road. At 820, a uh, presentation for the Household Recycling Committee uh, regarding the transfer, uh, transfer station report and recommendations. At 8.50, uh, the Deer Committee report to the Selectmen uh, regarding the Fall 2018 Hunting Pilot Program. At 9.30, a review of proposed uh, town meeting warrant articles. At 10 o'clock, the town administrator's report. At 10.15, the Board of Selectmen liaison reports. At 10.25, minutes, and at 10.30, adjournment. Again, as always, uh, some of the smaller items we may take out of uh, order if uh, if we are running ahead of schedule um, so with that uh, I will open it up for any community input yes um, hello my name is Jeannie Janetsko and I'm in Maple Street in Carlisle and I have um, three uh, inputs. One is that <clears throat> at the Deer Committee meeting at the beginning of uh, January, um, I think it's the beginning of January, the Deer Committee said they would not give us a copy of the final Deer Report and they said that what had happened is they would give that Deer Report to the Board of Selectmen and it was up to the Board of Selectmen to determine the distribution of that Deer Committee Report. I am requesting that since it is a public document that I would have a bit, uh, received that document, that it be made available to me. Uh, number two, as was mentioned at the last BOS meeting by a Carlisle citizen, I am reminding the Board of Selectmen of their promise that there would be a public meeting on deer. I haven't heard anything more about it, and uh, there has been no meeting so far, nor any notification of that meeting. And third, I would like to place my own placeholder for a warrant article with respect to the deer hunt and hunting on town lands and town forests for this upcoming uh, town meeting. So those are the three items. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll respond to one of the things which is that um, any, any report that is discussed uh, or presented um, at the Board of Selectmen meeting is um, uh, public uh, at the, uh, uh, along with the, the minutes of the meeting. It's the yeah, it's, it's on the website, the, the report? Okay. Okay. Um, so that, that report is uh, available. <coughs> um, uh, this meeting here is the, is the, the public meeting uh, that the Board of Selectmen is having on, uh, on the deer um, issue. Um, so, is there anybody else here for public input? Yes. Barbara Lewis, East Riding Drive. Um, I'm a member of the Carlisle Artisans and um, also parental unit or, or spousal unit of one of the board members. <laughs> um, is it parental I, or spousal? Yeah, not parental, spousal. <laughs> Um, I'm, where you're coming from. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here this evening because it was brought to my attention uh, recently uh, f um, by Marjorie Johnson that um, at the State House there's a hall of flags and there are 351 flagstaffs, one for each city and town in Massachusetts. Um, several are standing empty. One of them is Carlisle's. And I thought perhaps there was something that we could do about that. So Marjorie did some research and found the right person at the State House to get input on what, how to go about. And we have some criteria, uh, dimensions, and expectations of uh, flags that fly or hang there. And uh, I've recently found out that instead of having to do any design work or figure out what to create as a town flag, we do have a sanctioned, approved by town meeting in 
1973 an official town flag. Mm-hmm. So uh, the it's in the possession of the Minutemen. And so I've m- made a few calls and trying to contact the person who has the flag. I can't wait to see it. I do have some pictures of it. And I also have a card. This is all thanks to Charlene, who knew just where to look in the files. But it's a very attractive flag, so that helps to um, move forward on this if it uh, um, is approved. But I'll just pass this around. This can be handed sure. out. It's very nice looking, and it is mostly the town seal, which is what I would have gone with myself if we had to design one. But now it's all a matter of, now that we have the, the official design, um, it's a matter of process and figuring out how to replicate it. And as soon as I get to see it, knowing how it was created in the first place, and maybe by whom, but I, that may be lost. It's not in the information I have. Um, so yeah, I'd like to get a, another copy of the flag if there is only one, and maybe more than one more copy, one to f- be at the State House. And if we have any other use for a town flag in town, I could help to make that happen too. I haven't found any cost uh, at this point. Cost estimates were not forthcoming when, you didn't ha- when I didn't have a very secure design or plan, then uh, the companies that I did do research on weren't ready to give any kind of guess. So mm-hmm. it could be several hundred dollars. It could be lots more if we wanted to do it very elaborate. Some of the, I went on the state house, uh, the state website, and saw all the other designs. Some are very elaborate, some very simple. So anyway, just offering my services, our okay. services. We're gonna make this happen. Great. Great. Uh, is know? the background? Um, it, it is. I'm just wondering it's if it's, it's the color. Is it brown or yeah. is it a maroon? And or? so I really would like the idea of the flag fitting in but standing out. I think that that is very exciting look myself Mm -hmm. and it is unless we decide to approve a different design that's the one I think we would go with. Great. Barbara um, because you presented this to us at the table due to the open meeting law we're going to need to have a copy to um, include with our minutes. Can we keep this one? May. All right I will give that to the. Sounds like it looks like it came from town. Well it may have but I just I wanted and it's also to chase in it. the files here. <laughs> Get, that's a copy that was made for me today. Great. The Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anybody else here for public input? Jen, I'm having real trouble hearing people. Okay. Can you hear now? Can you hear a little better? I can hear you, yeah. yeah. Okay, well. I think this is our minutes now. I think there's somebody else. Yeah. Hold on. Input, I'm not sure. I can hear most of the people at the table, but... Uh, All right. Well, we'll give it another try after that adjustment. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Well, okay. I'm clear, yeah. All right. Uh, anybody else Republican? Yes. Good evening. My name is George Vendura from Maple Street. Um, I wanted to suggest that I represent some of the speakers here. Of course, I also represent the BOS. I represent um, in line with what the BS, BOS is doing. Uh, our concern, thank you. thank you very much. Our concern is uh, getting a warrant, of, of course, onto the town meeting with respect to the deer hunt. It's our understanding that there's, from Mr. Goddard, that there is already a placeholder in place for that warrant that the BOS already has something to that effect reserved and they met some sort of deadline and that's going to be addressed. My understanding also with respect to that is that of course the BOS is going to write the warrant or prepare a warrant. Now this is all a little vague on our part because we, we don't know the true full process and we don't know the full content of that warrant yet because it's just a placeholder. Apparently it's just a title. So uh, this thing is going to be written, of course, in the proper language for the town meeting in the warrant, whatever you want to call it, the uh, document that's being prepared. We would like to say in the writing of that very much, we would like to co-write it with the BOS, and we assume that that is the process. The reason why this is important, by the way, we're not trying to finagle in or, or control anything, but as we know from the history of this deer hunt thing, a lot of um, complications and controversy came up with the BOS or the deer committee or whomever writing, for instance, the signage. 
that some committee or subcommittee, the DARE committee to be specific, wrote into their uh, agenda, their, their feeling of what they were supposed to do, the signage. So they went ahead with the signage, and then the signage became complicated because it wasn't strong enough, it wasn't weak enough, it didn't have red paper. And so we could have benefited by working the signage, working the words together. So you guys, or we guys, or us guys, we guys in English, should perhaps take part in the, in the warrant preparation so that the BOS doesn't put a spin on it that represents your best case without having us with the input of that writing too. So my suggestion here, or maybe my question here is that the warrant will be written. You, BOS has a placeholder for it. We support that and we want to support that more uh, proactively by actually being part of the, the language so that we don't have differences of opinion and the warrant gets basically um, uh, teetered to one side or the other side uh, without us holding hands and do it in a common manner. Separately from that, in order to protect us from that, we the citizens propose our own warrant with respect to the deer hunt. Now you might say, well, this is redundant or this is going to be us or them. No, not at all. Um, perhaps, because I don't know what the language will be with, I'll call it the BOS uh, warrant, the BOS reserved um, placeholder, we're proposing a separate warrant. And with this meeting and with this date, with Mr. Goddard's help, we want to make sure that we are going to pro propose a second one and it goes on the agenda as the warrant agenda as tonight. Now, what are we trying to do that we wouldn't do with your warrant? Well, we don't know what your warrant is, and I don't think you know what your warrant is because we haven't figured out the language. Our warrant, which sounds redundant, is not redundant. It addresses the, um, the language or the, or the thrust of the very important editorial that was in the Carlisle Mosquito. And so the thrust of this, this warrant is, here it goes. This is from, by the way, editorial. Let me read the editorial, in just a little piece, okay? The question is, the weather, the where, the when, the how of bow hunting in Carlo will be decided at meetings. So this is sort of like an overview. Where does the authority lie with respect to the deer hunt? Well, maybe your warrant is the details of the deer hunt. So we want to know, or we want to empower this Carlisle and help the BOS to find out where the authority lies. Now what has happened before is that there was a question of who's, who's, running, who's running the decision making here. We went back and forth for weeks and weeks and weeks with respect, is it the BOS that has the ultimate authority? Or is it the DEER committee that has the ultimate authority? And the conservation committee is also somehow, you know, used as, as a source. And there's, the, there's also the Board of Health and the Lyme Committee. All these people have a stake in the deer hunt or the non-deer hunt. So our separate proposed not redundant warrant will address basically who and what is the organization and the authority. The, for instance, the um, Carlisle Mosquito says, well, it's the citizens, right? I mean, it goes to a complete general vote. So it's not the BOS, it's not the Board of Health, it's not the Deer Committee, it's not the Conservation Committee, and it's not the Lyme Committee. So again, with this, with this discussion right now, this monologue I'm having, where we, we, we also know there's the January 22nd deadline for the warrants, which is passed, but then Mr. Goddard says, no, that's loose, and it's still open. With this statement on this day, on January 29th, we, l we are now staking our own, or the citizens, I'll call it a claim, to a separate warrant for the, the, the addressing these issues of the deer hunt. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <coughs> All right, anybody else for uh, public input? Okay, not seeing any, um, let's uh, go to the appointment of the town facilities manager. Okay, if I could invite uh, Great. Steve to come down front come and meet up, the Steve, board. And you, can, you can sit right here. You don't uh, have to stand up Steve Bastock, who is our recommended candidate for town facilities manager. And uh, I'll let the 
Steve can uh, introduce himself and his background. I'll just tell you that uh, uh, <laughs> this was a, a rather a long uh, search uh, for uh, a facilities manager. We advertised a number of times. Uh, the most recent committee that uh, conducted the interviews included uh, Kate and myself, Bill Rizzo, John Mativier, and, and Rob Fortato, who is the school's new facilities manager, replacing uh, David Flannery. And um, of, of the candidates that we interviewed, you know, we, we certainly we felt Steve uh, kind of stood out as you know not only being you know qualified uh, uh, in the field, but having a, you know a, a, a good manner about himself and and uh, kind of having a nuts and bolts appreciation for facilities and uh, uh, you know we we felt he was a real can-do uh, kind of person and we liked that and uh, he got 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 on very well with the school. Uh, facilities manager. Uh, after we interviewed uh, with him, he met with the, the facilities uh, committee, the municipal facilities committee, and they uh, uh, unanimously recommend to this board that you you appoint him. But I'll I'll turn it over to Steve to introduce himself and his his background. So my name's Stephen Bastic. I'm a Tingsboro Mass resident. Uh, I've been in Tingsboro for almost 20 years now. Before that, I lived in Drake at Mass. Um, I have a background in electrical, as he mentioned. I am a master electrician. I hold mm -hmm. license current in Mass and New Hampshire as a master electrician. I also hold a grade two wastewater treatment license in the state of Massachusetts, which is also current at this time. Uh, my background consists from right from Greater Low Volk School, continuing chasing my career throughout the last 30 years in the field of electrical and maintenance inside of facilities operations including mission critical data centers uh, the last company that I was working with uh, working for was a semiconductor industry and uh, have wide range of background in house doing electrical uh, field projects running projects um, bringing projects together to get things done um, also have um, just trying to pursue the next level of uh, wastewater treatment, which will probably bring myself up to a grade four, which will happen. I have to go to school to go back to get that license again to follow up on the extending it to a grade four. But uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure glad to listen. Um. Uh, so I have some questions, but so so when you saw the Carlisle um, job posting, what made you decide to? to I'm looking that? for something that I'm not traveling and doing a SX, excess amount of time uh, traveling and trying to get back into uh, more of a facilities related role as more than I was doing electrical work. Uh, I like doing the facilities aspect of things. I like running jobs. Um, the hours seemed pretty good for me because it was a part-time position and at this point in my life my wife is retired and I am trying to spend a little more time at home with my wife at this point and uh, I'm just trying to you know make the best of things as I can at this point in my life okay and, uh, another question is you know when when you say when you're expedient you say that you you manage the data center daily operational functions at what level did you manage them uh, like so what types of things daily operations uh, at that point, that is a mission critical environment. Uh, we had multiple operations throughout the country. Uh, at my facility, I would run it remote and then pass through all the information needed to our corporate headquarters in Pennsylvania. So I would gather and collect bids for jobs that needed to get done during the year and propose those um, to the corporate headquarters f to get approval for this type of work that needed to get done and try to foresee, you know, problems that were going to come forth in the future and equipment that was going to have, you know, run down failure times and things of that nature and try to propose new equipment so that we weren't running in the face of it's too late now, it failed. We try to be pro proactive about trying to get equipment up and running and not have it go into a failure mode. It's not always possible, but we always try to, it was like a game of chess trying to all think, you know, what is the real runtime of this piece of equipment versus what we're actually using it at this point. 
And that equipment was like the HVAC system, yeah. the fire suppression system, Absolutely. the generators, generators. Not the actual systems and computers and what was in the cages and right. things like that. Okay. Right. That that's not anything what the I would physical, do. The physical it's a physical building. facility itself was what I would uh, be in charge of. Uh, and that was like I said, all the base operations of the uh, facility and then propose those to corporate to get those jobs done and get them done on time and, and on budget mm -hmm. and that was the primary thing and as well as doing emergency electrical repairs things of that nature that came up during the day if some some type of breaker tripped or some piece of equipment needed to be um, tested I was on site to do that type of work as well as bring contractors in to perform the work that I couldn't do. Okay. What do you see as the, just two more questions. That's right. That's okay. What, what, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you see as the biggest challenge to the person coming into this role? Uh, trying to play catch up on what you guys haven't done <laughs> over the years is probably <laughs> trying to prioritize what the list of things that you guys have put forth right now and get that rolling out the door so that you know you're not falling behind you know over time because time is your worst enemy you're just going to keep backing things up over over time and, and trying to set forth goals to get things done mm -hmm. okay and then just one other question um so you know you mentioned one of the reasons why you know this job was you know the hours you know more time at home totally get that what's the you know i guess it's almost the the opposite of the question I just asked, but what's the most exciting thing about this role for you? Uh, exciting, I'd say just to get my hands back into doing that type of work again and, and being in charge and getting the pe getting to know people and knowing contractors. Because when you work one-on-one -on -one with people, you end up becoming more like a family with people. And I like that role and, and meeting new people and getting things done and seeing how people work. and. I think the people part of it is probably the best part of the job. Mm -hmm. So you got to work with this guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's been working with me, and he's been okay. So yeah, no, that's how bad could it be? Yeah. Yeah. Have you had much budget experience? Uh, so, yeah, somewhat. Yeah, we had budgets that we had to maintain and follow at the data center, and we had to make sure that you know we were staying in in those numbers, like any business you know you try to stay in that number that's put forth but it doesn't always happen but you try to make it happen have you done much in budget development no okay. not a budget development yeah, we. <laughs> <laughs> well these he'll be working with the municipal yeah. facilities committee which yep. has been doing it and so I don't think that's uh, and, and we are looking forward, very much forward to Stephen for helping us do that because we're doing it, but we're doing it, you know, in the dark. Yeah. At least he knows more than we do uh, about a lot of these cost. things. So, <laughs> yeah, about the costs, you know. And then, so I think yeah. with, I think the two entities together will grow and learn working, together. Working with the new school facility. Have you, have you worked in government we'll before? Uh, no, my wife has uh, worked for the Air Force for 37 years. She retired from the Air Force, but uh, I haven't had any government experience. Just listen to her, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you, what, what we do often doesn't seem much like government either, so it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm really sorry to tell you, but since we last saw you, we've fallen further behind. <laughs> So hurry right. up and come. All right, we move that the Board of Selectmen um, vote to appoint. Oh, well, I just wanted to also tell you that the Municipal Facilities Committee is very enthusiastic about um, bringing Stephen on board um, and, you know, enthusiastically endorse his appointment. Excellent. So. Yeah, so I guess, you know, I, I would just say that, you know, the, you know, two of the questions, you know, like, you know, have you worked in government? You know, do you have budget um, experience? I, I, you know, you, you have a tremendous amount of experience of what, uh, of what we need um, and I also think that it's important that somebody who's moving into a role any role there's something that they're going to be yeah, learning to um, and yeah. so that there's some fulfillment for them as well so you know personally I'm not worried about that that you know that that's that's the thing that you would be learning um, but the you know the the base level of skills and, and the experience you have is clearly to me anyway what what we need in this town. Yeah. Right. and I, I'll just tell you Bill was also very excited 
Exactly. Yeah, gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think uh, there's a motion <laughs> wrapped up to right. There's a motion here. Yep. Right. I move that the Board of Selectmen vote to appoint Mr. Stephen Bastic of Tinksboro, Mass., as the facilities manager for the town of Carlisle. Second. Should, should we put his address in there? Just in case uh, there's more than one Stephen Bastic in, in Tinksboro? In I think it's. I don't have his address. It's not his and, resume. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Well, Tim, do we need the term before. of the appointment? To, do we need to discuss that? Or well, no? well, the appointment, you, you will reappoint all town officers in, uh, in June. Yeah, okay. So, so it's really, his appointment it, it is has, until June 30th. Yeah, okay. It'll be up for reappointment at that it'll point. It'll be reappointed so in June when we reappoint it's everybody. It's a routine kind okay. of thing, so I don't think we need to. Okay, I just I just wasn't sure. His address is for Bell Fair Lane. Okay. Okay, and is there a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Steve, hi. Hello. <laughs> right, Tim, could you just recap quickly the relation, the reporting relationship in terms of Steve will be reporting both to a committee and for some things to you. How, how will yeah. that work out? Well, I think for Steve will be taking his direction from the facilities committee who has a program of projects to manage for kind of the uh, uh, the mechanics of procurement and, and budgeting uh, and so forth. I'll be working closely with uh, Steve, as will Jen, quite frankly, for uh, legal requirements, uh, advertising of, of bids and, and uh, quotes and so forth. So it'll be, it'll be uh, uh, a joint effort in, in a lot of ways. But yeah, so I, I think the, the simple the answer, though, is that Stephen is going to be reporting to Tim. Right, I think that's right. exactly that's the, what I was saying. Well, <laughs> right, the contracting <laughs> yeah. authority is with is with this well, board yes. and, and overall authority me is for you. The, yes, correct. Helping, setting priorities in and everything. In terms of reporting, it, it, yeah, even reports overall to philosophy you. of yeah. he'll be working with the committee to set priorities and things like that. But he reports to Tim. Yes, no, we we've, we've talked about that. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, I'm yeah. trying to answer yeah. for yeah, no, I for Carrie. <laughs> yeah, right. So okay. it's reporting reporting to Tim with. Prioritization help through the right. committee. Right. Okay. And uh, okay. Okay. Did we, did we vote? Did we vote? Did we vote? No, not no, yet. Okay. okay. We had anything else, Carrie? No, thank you. I'm sorry, I forgot about you on the computer. Did you have, <laughs> did you have any questions <coughs> uh, for Stephen? No. 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 no okay. He seems eminently qualified. I was. Anybody that understands electricity is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know when I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, all those in favor, it's a roll call because oh, yes, it's roll call. Because Carrie's remote. Uh, so Brown Oscar aye. aye. Reed aye. Oscar Lillo aye. Lewis aye. It's unanimous. Okay. okay. So we're, we're good. Vote this direction. We'll okay. Go this time. Okay. Because All right. Thank you. Good, good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming and in. Good luck. Thank you. Can't wait to see you <laughs> the, the next uh, municipal meeting. <laughs> uh, when, when, when do you start? Well, it, it, as soon as we can, uh, we've got to figure out some of the terms of employment and pre-employment physical, but he can start and wants to start right away. So, so would you like me to come in? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll talk in the morning if that's all right. Okay. That's all right. Thank, thank you very much. Right. 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 Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Chief. Okay. Well, hopefully, um, the physical goes fine. We don't have to die. Appointment of the <laughs> finance Cynthia director. The intrepid reporter to yeah. <laughs> get her story. <laughs> no, she's getting a picture. Oh, picture for the paper. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, appointment <laughs> of the finance director. Okay. Bonnie. Could I ask uh, Bonnie. Bonnie Fleck to come forward? Nice to meet you. <laughs> This is the good news portion Bonnie of the meeting. Uh, <laughs> good news portion of the meeting. <laughs> Bonnie is our recommended candidate for finance director, treasurer, uh, collector. Um, we, we posted Carrie's position just as soon as she announced that she was leaving because this is a hard position to fill, quite frankly. Uh, and we, we were fortunate to get some good applications. Uh, the, the interview committee that I put together, again, consisted of Kate and uh, Priscilla Dumpka, our town accountant, Simon Platt of the Audit Committee, Victor Leung, and uh, Scott Triola, the Finance Committee, and myself. So we interviewed a number of candidates uh, uh, who had, had good qualifications, but you know, far and away, uh, Bonnie. Head and shoulders. Had, had uh, <laughs> the best qualifications. 
And, and, and by way of background, she uh, applied uh, for this position when Larry retired three years ago, I guess. And frankly, it was our number one choice then, but we couldn't convince her to uh, 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 leave Littleton at that time. But uh, we're very pleased that she's, uh, she's applied again. And, and also, in full disclosure, I hired her 13 years ago in Littleton and, and uh, <laughs> I'm very enthusiastic. I was going to say it. So. Yeah, about her. Uh, Possibly How much coming does here. And hate us for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'm about to find out. Yeah. I think. <laughs> well, don't but, drive uh, through Littleton if you're Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and Bonnie met the finance committee last night, yes. and both the finance committee and the audit committee uh, unanimously recommend uh, that the board appoint her. So with that. Thank you. <laughs> Bonnie, if you'd introduce yourself. Sure. Um, so, my name is Bonnie Fleck. Um, I obviously, as Tim said, work in Littleton currently. Um, I've been in municipal finance for almost 20 years, 19 years this year. Um, prior to that, I have a banking background, retail banking, commercial lending, and residential lending. Um, so I'm, I've been in finance pretty much my whole career. Um, I've been in Littleton for 13 years. As Tim said, he hired me, and um, about six months after I started, he gave his notice, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. what? You know. yeah, great guy. Um, yeah. You know, obviously, when you when you pick your career where you're going to go, you, you pick the team that you're going to be working with, so I was very disappointed at the time. Um, I should disclose I also worked with Jen in Littleton, um, <laughs> you know, for about 12 years, 11, 12 years. Um, so it was it was a really good team. Um, I loved the environment there, and I still love the environment. I have a great management team. Um, I will tell you that three years ago when I applied, the reason that I didn't come is my daughter was still choiced in at the school district there. So it's going to be a little bit of logistics to get her to school and pick her up like midday and drop her off because as a choice in student, you don't get busing or anything like that. Um, so that was really what it came down to. My daughter, I live in Lemonster, has um, joined the Lemonster School District, um, is very happy there. So it's a, it's a different set of circumstances at this point. Um, in Littleton, I served as the finance director, and for 11 years, I served also as the assistant town administrator, the chief procurement officer. Um, I served as town accountant, um, HR director, and you know, investigator, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, about three years ago, they divided my position into two. Um, it left me at finance director, which is what my desire was to be, and hired a separate sis assistant town administrator. Um, so that's, you know, worked pretty well. Um, the duties haven't exactly been divided, you know, it's, it's, it's a growing process, you know, it takes a little bit of time. Um, but, you know, they're, they're working towards that. Um, also undertaken in the last three years, we've done a major system conversion. We've gone from SoftWrite um, software, our financial suite, to Munis. Um, we're about three-quarters of the way through the conversion. Um, all the core financials, accounts payable, um, general ledger is converted. We're in the middle of payroll, tax, and um, human resources now. And um, doing pretty well with it. Everything's working. Um, right now, I'm working on the tax conversion, and my treasurer and, uh, collect and, my treasurer and HR person is working on um, payroll and HR with me. So we've got a, a lot on our hands, but I have a really good group of individuals, and uh, we work really well as a team. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. Okay. I don't know. But <laughs> so I'm, I am actually going to ask the first question, but I'm going to direct it at Tim. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so you left six months after <coughs> hiring her. <coughs> <laughs> what are your plans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm made a promise to stay here if she, if she, if <laughs> I she, she comes over this time <laughs> uh, very much want to yeah want to work together and and I, I you know since uh, I, I left there you know a dozen or so years ago I've been town moderator all the time in between so I've had a chance to see you know w what Bonnie's done over there with the uh, co the consolidated uh, finance department and policies and procedures and they're they're pretty close to funding OPEB and they've done some really remarkable things uh, they've had a lot of growth too, but they, you know, managing the growth is, is not easy too. But uh, maybe you, if you could talk about the policies and procedures, because sure. we desperately need them. Sure. So. I, I actually looked online to see your policies and procedures and couldn't find them. <laughs> um, I did see that the um, Division of Local Services had made some recommendations about some templates or, or pretty much generalized policies and procedures, but I didn't see that they were adopted yet. Um, when I went to Littleton, we really didn't have much for uh, financial policies and we have a very robust set of 
policies that we follow and we adhere every year. Um, and it's almost, it's rote. We just, we go through them every year, we review them, and then we go through them for our financials and make sure that we've put the reserves away that we need to, that we're allocating enough to replenish our free cash every year. Um, those are done before we even craft the budget. So that those things are off the table. Um, through our policies, you know, we've, we've raised our bond rating. We're a AAA community with Standard & Poor's, um, which we're very proud of. Uh, we maintain some high levels of reserves, um, and again, they're all dictated through policy, so it's off the table before it's even discussed. Um, OPEB, we are almost, we're very close to meeting the ARC, um, which I'm really happy about. Um, so we're putting about, we put $2.3 million aside last year, and we're putting about $2 million aside this year. Last year, we took additional um, amounts out of our free cash. That required us to augment OPEB first, so we did that. Um, two millions are kind of our normal amount. Um, we do have to increase that by 10% every year. Um, we set aside about 10% of new revenues, which includes amounts out of the tax levy, um, unappropriated, just to replenish our free cash and make sure that we have that available for capital. Um, we stopped doing debt exclusion overrides um, and um, using free cash on the operating budget between 2008 and 2009 which is a real accomplishment for Littleton. Back when I came, they were using free cash in the operating budget. Um, there was no 10-year capital plan. We have, we, we had annual capital appropriations, but no plan. Um, and I say plan loosely, it's a fluid document. You know, you put things out 10 years, it's, they're gonna change. Um, but we know kind of what we're looking at, where the big items are coming in and what might be, you know, what we might need to pull in versus push out. Um, we do that in coordination with all the department heads, which I'm really proud of. Uh, we get everybody together in one room um, for a budget hearing day on a Saturday in January, which you know nobody really wants to do, but everybody you know, comes in and participates. So everybody hears the same story, the Finance Committee, the Board of Selectmen, all the department heads hear everybody's budget. So there's no question of what's that one doing, you know, what might be presented to the selectmen might be different than the Finance Committee heard because time changes things. Um, so I, you know, I, I like that process. Everybody hears the same message. Um, because of that, over a few years, it really got to fostering an environment where even the departments, I mean, this year is a good example. Our fire department, the chief requested an additional staff person. Well, he's got a new station and a new ladder truck and six new paramedics over the last four years. And he went to the budget hearing and said, you know what, I'm going to withdraw this because there are other needs. And I recognize that you know, even though the board's not pressuring him to withdraw it, he, he's involved in the process. And he said, you know, the highway department needs things, police department needs things, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold back this year. And that just, it creates a good environment, a working environment, you know, for the departments. And everybody knows what everybody else is doing. So it's, it's a nice place to work. Thank you. Questions? Let's start. Carrie, any questions? Uh, Bonnie, it's uh, no, so nice to meet you. I've heard so many wonderful things about you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm very happy to, to meet you. Um, we're, um, we're in the process of kicking off a master plan next year, potentially, if we get the money for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and, that. Uh, you, you've gone through that fairly recently, I believe, in Littleton, the master planning process update. Yes, we have. What, what do you see as, as what your role might be for a five-year look-ahead kind of a kind of a planning process? Um, in Littleton, what we found success in is creating a master plan implementation committee, which kind of puts forward like you do the, the the plan, and then you know it could somebody could file it away and it could gather dust on the shelf if there's not a committee to follow through with the implementation process. So I work with them through the budget process to figure out what their needs are, you know, identifying the needs in the plan and meeting those funding requirements and getting them out to the, to the voters and to the boards and committees that need to vote on recommending those items. Um, and, you know, some of them are more popular than others, um, but, you know, they, they need to be put out there. Otherwise, the plan's going to get stale dated and, you know, fall out of useful usefulness. Thank you. You're welcome. So aside from the four people on the other side of the table and the one on the computer, what do you see as uh, your, your biggest challenge in this new role? Um, I think, you know, the communities, every community that I've been in is very different. So learning the community flow and priorities is always my first um, kind of 
priority in my in my own career. Um, what's important for Littleton is not necessarily what's important to Carlisle. And a good example um, that I mentioned to the finance committee is just driving through the community. Littleton, you know, it's on it's 495 and Route 2, and there's a lot of you know transient traffic that drives through commuting. Um, so their priority in doing roadways is complete streets. They want bike lanes. They want sidewalks. They want traffic to move through fast, quick, get out. Um, so when we build roads, we build them with all of this infrastructure and we meet complete street guidelines. That's the community goal. Driving here tonight, you know, it's in, and it's, it's a different feel. It's narrower streets. You're trying to, it feels like it's trying to slow traffic to, you know, meet the community goals. You don't want big sidewalks going through. Um, or that's just the impression that I get. So it's just kind of identifying what those goals are and seeing how you can develop your financial policies and guidelines to meet those goals because they're different in every town. Um, they can be very different in, in adjacent towns. Um, so it, it, that is what I like. It's almost like a puzzle and it's, it, it fits with the financial documents that you create. It's, it's fitting everything together and making it flow the right way that the community wants. It's not my document, it's, it's yours. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's probably my challenge initially, um, getting to see how things run. Um, you know, it's a lot of observation in the first few months. You're not gonna go in, you know, making changes right away. You know, you have to see how things work. Um, but I like to identify that fit and, and kind of work that puzzle together to, to meet your goals. Well, again, I was at uh, last night's FinCom meeting, and they were very enthusiastic <laughs> uh, in support of this num uh, this appointment. Mm -hmm. okay. So you may um, you may want to become uh, friends with uh, Stephen, who was here before, because as I understand it, um, where you sit is very very cold in the winter time. Hopefully, <laughs> 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 less so. Bring my Ugg boots. Uh, project we're doing, but yeah. Um, so anybody. Anybody? I don't have any other questions. Oh. Priscilla, did you have anything you wanted to say? Ample opportunities. Priscilla was on the yeah. committee and she was uh, with us last night at FinCom as well. Okay. Uh, is there a motion? I move that the Board of Selectmen vote to appoint Ms. Bonnie Mae Fleck of Lemonster, Mass, uh, 20 Myrtle Street, as the Finance Director, Treasurer, and Tax Collector for the Town of Carlisle. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll start with you, Carrie. Kissing her eye. Reed eye. Brown eye. Oscar little eye. Lewis eye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Congratulations. Very much. I shake your hand, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I don't blame her. Gotta get the twenty-sixth on her agenda. You can kiss her. Is that the next one? Yeah. I don't know when she's starting now. When is about thirty days? Oh, we didn't didn't uh, talk about yeah. that. It, but Bonnie, before you go, do you want to talk to the board about a start date? Are yes. you going to work that out? Yeah, we, I mean, we can work those terms out. I, I, I have enough flexibility, you know, that um, my contract says that I have to give 60 days notice, but I have a lot of vacation time because I've been mid-conversion and I haven't taken any. <laughs> so um, I told Tim that we could kind of work things out. And, and Littleton more is like a good community to work with. They'll, they'll, so more they'll work like, with me. More like 30 days, yeah. probably. Yeah. With some shuffle back and forth, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. I should ask that earlier. Okay. Any you know, questions? All right. Uh, Seven forty-five. Oh. There about you. Um, we're going to move up. on to the proposed job description for the assistant to the conservation. <laughs> Ed, oh, Ed, oh, oh, boy. Yeah. I don't see them here. Uh, all right. Why don't you just water? run? Water. <laughs> I'd love some. Um, we'll give one minute break. Okay. Um, I have this. I asked for it in color because I found it very hard to read. I don't know if you got to see it in color. I did. What's that? Okay. I'll go see if it's not there. Really? Because when I'm on mine. Oh, no, you're right. I didn't see the color. No, it's a, well. I didn't realize that there was other edits. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> Anybody else? Kate, do you want to work? Um, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm all set. Um, 
That can ask me as soon as I sit down. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you print it to the PDF, could you print it in color? I can do that right now. No, no. It, in, in, in future. Yeah, for the packet. Yeah, you know what? I think when it definitely realized it was, there was two options for red light immersion. Uh -huh. No, we got the red line. It's just we can't. Well, it, we got we the strike out. Red. <coughs> Nobody wants to hear me. No, we really don't. <coughs> Actually, the community <laughs> has spoken. Um. And so have you. I'm so <laughs> yeah. I won't stop. Okay, I'm not going to be happy with what I have to say. They are here now. All right, so we'll move on to the proposed revised job description for assistant to conservation administrator. So do you want to come on up front? Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. He just wants to be on camera. <laughs> 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 I'm, uh, I'm Angie Verge. I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission. Sylvia Willard, our conservation administrator. And we are here for two requests. I know one is on the agenda, so I just want to make sure that the uh, change in hours, uh, increase in hours for the administrative assistant to the conservation administrator is something that we're also um, talking about. So the reason we're here is the change um, you know, that the needs of the town have changed. The needs of the Conservation Commission office have changed. We have been asking for an increase in hours for our administrative assistant for four or five years now. Oh, I was on the board. You were <laughs> at one point, too. Um, so basically, where we're, where we're at is we're requesting uh, that our administrative assistant be up to 35 hours per week. This is a request that we had put before the personnel board in January of 2017 which they uh, reviewed the job description, the job requirements, and approved and uh, agreed that the job did require 35 hours. Last year we asked for that, and you know we understand that there were no hours given. So we're back again. So we went to the personnel, uh, excuse me, the finance committee with our request, and they asked us to go back to Tim to see if uh, the request was still valid or if the conditions were still the same. Uh, we then went back to the personnel board and got our second approval that, yep, job still requires 35 hours. Um, so then we went back to finance committee who said, go to board of selectmen. So we're respecting the process and we've been back and forth a few times and, and now we're here. <laughs> um, so we had, um, we had sent you some information about the job description, but I just wanted to start briefly with the hours. So again, this is something that we've been going on for quite a while now. Um, again, the needs of the town have changed. Uh, we just can't keep up with the workload right now. We have a lot more projects in town that require wetland permitting. Um, a lot of the projects are bigger. And even some of these smaller development projects where we have, you know, four or five houses going in, some of the problems are just uh, exponential. And it requires a lot of Sylvia's time being out of the office doing site visits uh, to kind of understand what's going on. Um, and having somebody in the office at those times is, is definitely critical because we still have our everyday filings um, in, in addition to that. So we did um, spend some time, too, looking at the efficiencies of the office because, of course, the Finance Committee said, well, can't you do the same job in the same amount of hours that you currently have? So we did spend some time meeting with uh, Tom Smith. We met with Victor Liang, reviewed what we do in our office. They spent some time with us going over things, and um, I think they understand a little bit about how our office works. And we have an administrative assistant currently who is extremely capable of bringing more efficiencies to the office if she has time to bring the efficiencies to the office. Um, there are databases that can be uh, m uh, better filing systems, uh, management of our projects um, to help kind of bring the, some order to the office. Again, we just don't have that time. Um, in addition to that, you know, we have um, more subcommittee responsibilities. Uh, right now, the cranberry bog. Uh, working group. <laughs> so our new one uh, is, is gearing up, and this is going to be something that's going to take a significant amount of the mm. office's time on uh, the next couple years. Uh, in addition to that, we have the deer hunt program, which Mary was given 
Um, and to date, she has spent approximately 60 plus hours uncompensated for this particular project. And that, so that, that's within a short period of time. That's right. between, say, the middle of July, and it came on board with her when it was overseas. So, <laughs> so I'm sorry to do this, but the hours just isn't anywhere in our packet here. Could we start with the job, yes. the job changes? Because yep. Yep. we're not going to be able to but say okay. anything. It might have been my misunderstanding. I thought we were going to talk about the job description first. And right. I mean, the, the two are related. There's no question. I know, because FinCom was waiting right. for but, but this not, yeah. discussion. In, in, well, I guess just can I ask a question about FinCom then. Uh, um, sure. Is, are the hours then in your guideline? Did they put those yes. the money yeah. in yeah. the your Think guideline yeah. Yeah. enough for the five hours? Yes. Or whatever. Okay. So that's already in your yes. guideline. Right. So okay. That that was there. All right. That's okay. What isn't there is um, the changing grade that would come with uh, change in the um, from this way. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I'm sorry. So we'll jump to that. No, that's fine. And, yeah, and they're, yeah, they're no. the somewhat related. <laughs> um, somewhat related. Um, so when we last met with the personnel board, we kind of got a better idea of how the grade and step program works. Uh, it's a little confusing. There was some misunderstandings between various departments. Uh, we got a good education as far as how that works. Um, we have been, <coughs> this is now our second uh, attempt to try to change the job description. And basically, we don't need an administrative assistant. We need an assistant to the conservation administrator. Um, there are more and more projects that require Sylvia to be out of the office. And we don't just need somebody there answering phones. We need somebody there who is actually answering questions, handling issues, um, directing people to the right agencies and such, you know, able to retrieve the files. Um, someone who does more. Um, as part of our job description, one of the things we're changing is the minimum education. I mean, we need somebody who has a stronger background in conservation, has a, a higher level degree, um, knows the Wetland Protection Act, certified in that. Um, so this is something that you know we're, we're still passionate about. And we really believe that we need someone who has a little bit more um, experience. And, and um, you know, some of the things I listed in and, and again, this is kind of related to the hours, too, and just what's going on in our office. Again, the needs of the town have changed. We have so many more development projects. Um, you know, we had this uh, nor'easter. Do you have the red line document? They, we do. They don't. Oh. Well, yeah, we, they we have do. A, we don't have the yeah. color, but we yeah. have oh. Oh. But you can see what's color and what is. Yeah. No, they can't. Oh. Can they can't. Well, I have one. Well, I, 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 I have okay. this. I have four yep. copies. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. okay. Oh. Just, yeah, we kind of did it this way to indicate what we added. Um, to be a little, oh, okay. I have another one if someone needs one. Mm -hmm. I don't need one because I, okay. I realized that I had no understanding at all of what I had, so I asked for one. Because <laughs> 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 I realized, um, yeah. We, this um, this um, job description, I guess I don't have one now. Uh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, was put together basically after really taking a really good hard look at what my assistant actually does. This isn't made up, this is what she does. And uh, we met with the personnel board and the um, uh, George Mansfield, the planning um, town planner was there, and Linda Fantasia, the board of health agent was there, and they both supported, uh, on record, who supported this um, idea of changing the administrative assistant to the assistant to the administrator. Um, and, and Tim has been very helpful too in coming up with, with this um, job description. So how many hours is this person? It would be 35. Yeah. She currently works. Is it? And what that is so is 27, yeah, 27 hours Oh, and so this is also budget. the person you want to add the hours? Yes, to. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. And I, the, my other question is, does um, this trigger having to adverti advertise and um, interview, mm -hmm. post an a interview um, for the position because it's a change in position? I, I, I don't think that it does. I think it, it more accurately reflects the duties and responsibilities of, of the position. Uh, the title the title is different, but uh, it, it's not uh, it's not so different that you consider it a, a, a new position. 
I know last year we had a situation yes. where it, it, it was so changed so much that, that the personnel board said this is really a new position. Could you just verify that so that we don't? Oh, yeah. With, with them, right. We're not asking for two grades. We're asking for one grade change to, to six. And, you know, it's not and what's the, so at 30 hours, uh, <coughs> what's the, the uh, budget differential for the grade change? I, I, I don't know what the, uh, I don't have the rate chart right in front of me now. I, I'm, yeah, I wouldn't, I, I couldn't estimate it without seeing the chart on that and again the grade is I mean it's, it's one thing to request a grade or you know or two or whatever. it's really what the personnel board determines it to be it's not as if you can go in and say give me a you know right, I'm just and I, I don't think that, that I think that's want, what I'm just, I'm Sylvie was if, saying if we, if we say yeah let's go with this what's the impact on the budget mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it goes to a we have to figure that one out I guess yeah, All right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again it this is what she does yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. She has an associate's? She has a certificate of um, learning. She has a what? She, certificate of learning, higher learning. So she meets these requirements? Yes. She, yeah. she because of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. So she has, you know, 15 years experience in conservation office. Well, because under education experience, it requires an associate's degree. In or a related certificate field. of higher or learning. Or yeah. certificate yeah. of higher learning. Okay. So if we were okay. to ever have to hire for this position, Got it. definitely. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and she, she brought with her several years of experience in the science division at Mass Audubon. And that has yeah. proven to be extremely helpful. Yeah. Very, very helpful. Because it has a, a broader experience, experience beyond just wetlands. What happens when somebody changes grade? Do they change grade at the same step that they were at? No. They, they, when you increase by a grade, you go to step one of the new grade. Okay. So that's. That's the convention that is, <laughs> has been used here in town. And as personnel director, <laughs> do you support this um, this change? I mean, well, well, I, I do because I I think the job description as originally uh, drafted in, in the study now three four years ago didn't capture a lot of the duties and responsibilities. Even something like the minutes for a, a, a kind of a quasi-judicial board it has to be very specific and very detailed uh, because they might end up in a, you know, mm -hmm. in litigation. So, uh, you know, there are certain parts of this job that are that are bigger uh, in scope than, than in others. And, and I think this job description, I think, accurately f reflects that. Okay. And then some of the, the things that have been added on, like the DEER program and it. And other things. So that you've taken out the requirement that they attend the meeting. No, it's just put in I a just different spot. It. It's re yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw it somewhere. It, it, she does. I mean, she does go to all the meetings. She goes to the meetings. In fact, she's the only. Black and white. Yeah, it's really. Right. <laughs> in fact, she's the only administrative assistant that Central does go to. The in fact, she's the only administrative assistant that does attend the, the meetings of the board. And would be and is responsible. Session, yeah. Necessary yeah. Too, which how, is many, how many administrative <laughs> assistants are there in town? I don't know. I don't Do know. you? Yeah. Maybe, maybe six, six or eight for, yeah. that work for the various boards. Some very part-time hours to, you know, people that work 30 or 35 hours a week. It, it depends on the board, I think. And, the level of activity for that board. I'm not in this case. It's a full-time administrative assistant, so similar to planning or board of health, or uh, well, even this, I, even this I board. I guess my question goes Jen. to how many of those could make the same case that they've grown in the job over the years and, and they're more than an administrative assistant. They are now potentially assistant assistants to the administrators of those functions. I mean, can anybody, every one of those positions, claim that? I don't think so. Uh, some, some have, but I, I don't think they all could. I mean, I, I think it depends on the board and depends upon what that, that assistant is, is required to do. So I don't, I don't think uh, they're not all the same, not in my mind. There are some boards that, you know, really need. You're not need saying that the person that currently holds the position uh, doesn't qualify for this new position. We're saying that the, this person is eminently qualified for the new position yes. as well. 
Yes. 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 This, yeah, this person is doing that position. And she's doing the work. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's important to remember that when you're, you're crafting a job description, you're not, you're not writing it for an individual. You're writing it for if someone walked in off the street, what would we need this person to do? What kind of education experience would a stranger need to do this job? We, you know, right. there's a tendency to personalize it, I think, but we really, you, know, you have to kind of, you know, put that to the side and just look at the position. So there really are two dimensions. There's the hours available to get the job and work done, and then there's the complexity of the work to be done, right? Mm -hmm. right. Just I, I must say that when I read the what you had what you had presented with your red line document, it, it pretty much said you know things are as you said things are changing, but they're always changing. But things are increasing. They always seem to be increasing. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of justification for your request as I read it. Now I'm I'm, I'm not you know that's I'm just going by what I read and not what you're. Right saying and what you've researched um yeah. did you get the one that um did you get the one that was red like do you I see how I, mean, you, I couldn't i couldn't see it as red ah. it was underlined or stricken out or no what? no no the this it's it's not they're stricken out and then there's a lot that's added in red and you can't tell when you're reading it in black and white which part is red and which and the end was added and which part was already there yeah, but I, I did read the uh, what has been added, and, and and it struck me that most of that said yes, this is get we're in, this is increasing, that's increasing, um, and as I recall, you know the deer committee and the and the bog are the only two new things, and when the deer committee came to us and came to the com came to you and said we need to we need some help, it was oh yeah we can we can help. I mean it was readily given, so that, that's all I'm saying. I, I really can't comment on whether or not this is either one of the complexity or the hours are, um, are, are uh, and should be approved because I'm not that close to it but all I'm saying is that as I read it uh, it just seemed like pretty much business as usual okay so, well, so maybe what you're saying is business as usual isn't correct isn't the correct way to describe it Right. I, I, I think she uh, has a lot more uh, responsibility than, um, than when the position was originally created. And I think we need to give her more responsibility to take some of the load off of Sylvia. So we don't want to ask this person to do a significant uh, amount of tasks that are not in her job description without being properly compensated. Um, I think it's important to understand that we have all these situations that keep coming up that require Sylvia to be out of the office. For example, we had that nor'easter last March. All of a sudden, we had four construction projects in town that busted through their siltation barriers. We have chocolate milk mud running down the streets, homeowners calling. Um, these are the situations that we can't plan for, that this just comes up. Sylvia needs to be out of the office, and we need someone in the office to manage all of these other uh, filings that we have that are under deadlines by state regulation. It's a it's a tough it's a tough amount of work to juggle, and I think it's important to make sure we have somebody that is qualified, capable, and can handle more responsibility as the town grows and as our needs grow and as we continue to acquire more conservation land that requires management. Yeah, and even I mean I was on the board four years ago, right? I think, mm -hmm. geez, that long ago. Uh, <laughs> and, and just even in that time, it seems like the the projects have gotten more and more complex mm -hmm. um, you know we used to have a lot of filings be done in a night and boom you move on I mean you guys have stuff that lasts months now um, and we got a big one coming yeah and there always seems to be yeah. a big one coming yeah, and you know especially as, as buildable oh, lots night. decrease and as people start to split lots you know and people are doing these you know cl uh, conservation clusters every and as everything changes and this gets more and more complex um, you know as Sylvia's pulled in more and more directions and you know I know um, even when I was on the board, there were times when people would show up at the office, Sylvia would be out, Mary wasn't there, you know, because she was working, I think, 25 hours at that point in time. Um, and it was just, you know, it was hard because if people come in, nobody would be there, then, you know, Sylvia would have to reach out to them after, after work or whatnot. Um, and, and, you know, Mary has actually, you know, once her hours increase, she's actually stepped up to the plate and and helped out more and as right. people come in takes on you know, some of the stuff that i do right and and i'm glad to see that the job description is changing i mean i think we talked about this a while back right. as mm -hmm. to 
you know, how could we change her duties? Um, but ultimately what's happened, I think, is over the past few years, she's actually done those things. And, and now it's really just, you know, putting it into place that, okay, she has done these things. She's really helped out. You know, she deserves to be um, compensated and, and recognized for the work that she's doing. Um, you know, I mean, I think 35 hours a week was justified years ago. <laughs> um, and, and it's only, you know, going to continue. I mean, because we do, we acquire more conservation land, which requires more monitoring. We have more conservation restrictions. I mean, yeah, but we're, you know, it's just more and more stuff comes in and it just adds to the complexity of everything and, and the time that's needed to manage these things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, and, and it's good that it's changing to an assistant to you as opposed to just an admin because it really, it more represents what Mary is doing now. Some towns, well. <laughs> some towns <laughs> change my title well. to conservation director or something along that line. Yeah, they, yeah, I, I know, because we looked at this and, yeah, like, mm -hmm. um, Concord's got a different name. They've all got a yeah. little different mm -hmm. title. Mm -hmm. Concord has how many full-time assistants? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they granted, they're three different, full -time, but, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. I, I'm sympathetic, there's no question. But, and, I've under, and I understand that there's another department that's recently rejiggered their uh, functions and titles um, last year uh, of their staff. But what I'm worried about is disorganized function creep. Um, in our in our offices uh, and I, I was set to come tonight and propose a moratorium on all changes until we get a consultant in to look at our new and expanding needs because I do think we do have we have um, our, we have our current town operations um, need efficiencies which uh, they need uh, to plan for future expansion they need to some of them the functions I think should be consolidated um, and maybe we needed an alternate organization in general and I don't think we're prepared to, to study that and propose a plan I mean we I think we could certainly do a stopgap to help Conscom but I, I don't see it as I I'm worried that this is just like the tip of the iceberg and that we're just going to be chasing these problems and we're not going to have a really good solution we're going to band-aid everything and then we're going to end up with like the house that Jack built and nothing's going to work That's okay so say. it sounded to me like uh, you would like the you would like us to consider doing something that's looking longer term yes but that uh, while you were thinking about proposing a moratorium, perhaps you're not doing that now for this particular role. Well, because I'm but very sympathetic to this role and I understand the needs, so I don't want to say no to you, um, but uh -huh. I think that we need to do something way more longer term. Right, so I think-, I think Which takes that, time. I Which think, takes I time. for that, we, yeah. you know, we, should, we should meet with the personnel board and, and talk through what we might want to do if, if we choose to do that um, yeah. and uh, but but for this particular thing for, for me personally you know I'm not opposed to it uh, but I, you know I can't say yes until I know how much it's going to cost mm -hmm. um, and so that that's just a critical piece of information is how much is it going to cost for the grade change and then how much additional would it also cost for the next piece that you're that the hours the, the hours yeah. um, just you know just to be fiscally <coughs> responsible I, I can't I can't sit here and say yes we're gonna take on that project without knowing or that but position or whatever without knowing the cost I understood that FinCom has already put in the extra five hours it's, it's at, at a certain 35 yeah, we're still going to be talking to FinCom about that and they're I'm, gonna be asking yeah. our our input yeah. I understand and, I'm, but yeah. I'm just saying that so you know that the process is it comes to the board of selectmen yeah. and we say yes we support the role in general without really knowing how much it is yet then it goes to personnel board and then it should come back to us so that we know how much it's going to cost and we can say yeah we would support it or not um and then it would go to fincom um and uh so uh you know uh, the personnel board you know doesn't doesn't decide if the hours are needed um what they decide is is the grade appropriate for the job description whether the hours are needed is just is a discussion that we would have and you know and a lot of trust in the committee saying yes it, we need the hours right 
Um, you know, so, so I, in general, I support it, but I can't say yes without knowing the, the cost impact. It sounds like we need to talk anyway about the hours again. So, what is our next step? <laughs> well, I, I, I can get to the board what the the fiscal impact yeah, would be of the. Okay. For the so hours by themselves, and then the hours with a with a step a grade change. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'll have that for you tomorrow. And then we can, and we can chat about it at our next selectman meeting because it's already in FinCom's budget. Right. Um, right. And then we, so maybe we could just chat in the next meeting for fifteen minutes, and we'll put it early so you don't have to hang out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Tim will get us some information as far as the budget impact yes. of our well, requests. I was, only, I was only saying my opinion, but let's get the sense from Karen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh, aren't you chair? But I think, but I think doesn't always go. <laughs> yeah. Kerry, your sense, sense from you? Well, I, I can't, as I say, I can't comment on the hours and the validity of that because I'm just not, I don't know. Uh, I think if the personnel board has looked at the job description and if they feel that that's appropriate then uh, they're in a, a better position to uh, to, to you know weigh in on that and I, I would have to agree with their assessment okay Kate yeah, a, okay. yeah they've done I think waiting two weeks is not going to do things one way or the other we can do all that all yeah I was time. just yeah. thinking if yeah. the majority of the board were going to go like against it and yeah. no I don't oh, I don't <laughs> see that there's, there's no question that yeah. our conservation land has been significantly increasing with mm -hmm. time we keep adding more and more stuff yeah. at some point we're going to have to bite the bullet and say we need to deal with that mm -hmm. and this is maybe an appropriate way to do it It'd be nice to know what's going to cost us mm -hmm. we also have um, an open space plan that we have to update which is just beginning to get geared up now it, it, um, and it's good to for the town to have one of those that are current. Um, There's a big project that she will be working on as well. I'm not sure we mentioned that a little earlier. Those come up every seven years. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, item eight o'clock item. Sorry, we're running behind. Um, we were running it on mm -hmm. time, but um, citizens petition for twenty one twenty three Bedford Road. I don't see Eric. Is Eric here? here? All right, I'm not going to discuss that then. Yeah. He knew it was on the agenda. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So if you could just let him know, we could put it on next time if he's interested in it. Mm -hmm. Is anybody else here? Ask if anybody, anybody, anybody here, here for that item? Okay. The citizen petition. Okay, so now we are going to move on to the. Uh, uh, I'm not going to do that yet. Could you want to just do a couple things on the um, town administrator's report? Sure. Let's do. Okay. Yeah, Ronnie, you think? Yeah. Uh, First item in my report is the suggestion of the board that with the, the uh, complete streets grant that uh, the state awarded to us uh, in December uh, and, and actually finally told us today we can talk about it because uh, oh. <laughs> there was an announcement next week and they were very concerned that we'd, we'd I don't know who they thought we would tell besides the <laughs> townspeople that uh, you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollars is real money, and that wow. uh, I think you know, rather than have a working group dealing with that, we probably should have a formal mm -hmm. complete streets committee. So I've listed the people that have been part of that that working group. I I would think that uh, 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 if you want to uh, advertise more broadly for more members, we can. We, uh, certainly, the people that have been involved in it, I think, have an interest in continuing. But I'm just suggesting that we formalize that structure because it it's needs to be a real committee because they'll be recommending on spending uh, you know real funds after the improvements are designed so yeah so I, I agree completely having a formal committee I think that if we're going to be appointing people to a committee though it would be good to have what the charter is yeah. and 
mm -hmm. um, kind of a little formality around you know reporting and check-in times and things like that and yeah. maybe you and I could draft something for the next meeting sure I totally agree with you though that we should formalize it, should it. Be, it's yes. a big um, project but yep. you know yes. lots lots of times you know you go and you, you you try to look for you know what's the charter of a committee or you know what do they do and, and there isn't anything um, and so I'd like us to always have that charter yeah. okay all right, uh, I know that uh, Kate's going to be heading out of town for a few weeks, and she's one of the designated approvers of uh, uh, payroll and bill warrants uh, in the event the board is unable to meet uh, in a quorum. And uh, it was suggested that uh, uh, if we could appoint another board member as a, as a backup, that we would be ensured that someone would be around in the event that the board's not meeting and a warrant needs to be approved. Alan, are you generally I, I was going to nominate Kerry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that totally solves the problem. <laughs> We're gonna move the town to Florida every winter. <laughs> right. right, I didn't want to presume too much, but yeah. obviously Alan's around a lot during the week. You're around, you're willing to do it? Sure. Okay, is there a motion? I uh, move that Alan um, Lewis be appointed um, a signer. Right. What do we call them? Um, approval. An approver of, of an approved uh, warrants. Sign in the event that the board of selectmen yes. are not able to. Yes. In that. Yeah. Here we go. Second. Tied. All right. Uh, all those in favor, starting with you, Kerry. Kissing your eye. Reed eye. Brown eye. Oscar Willow eye. Lewis eye. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. And also attached to the report, you'll uh, find a, a letter from Niles and uh, Christy Kokenauer regarding this year's old home day uh, activities. They're requesting approval on the board for the weekend of June 22nd for this year's old home day celebration and uh, we've included the usual motion uh, and the use of town facilities and uh, with the understanding that they coordinate with uh, the town's public safety officials which they always do uh, later I want to talk to them about where they store their stuff oh right, right right yeah because they're currently uh, in the DPW uh, barn. I'm trying to clear that out. Okay. Neither here nor there. Is, there's, a, <laughs> there's a motion here. I move that the board approve the request of the old home day committee to use town properties, facilities, and roadways to stage the old home day celebration on the June 22nd weekend as described in the request of January 14th, 2019, and that they will coordinate their efforts with Carlisle's public safety, safety officials. Second. Okay, we're first and second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Kerry? Kissing your eye. Reed eye. Brown eye. Oscar Lula eye. Lewis eye. Okay, <coughs> and we have just two more items here. Keep going. One more, really. Okay, uh, there's a request from Chief Fisher to appoint a part time police officer, Michael Fateau of Hollis, New Hampshire. And his background is described in the memorandum. That uh, is attached. Uh, do you need a, a motion for that? To uh, yes, to appoint. Uh, okay, I'm okay. Patel of Hollis, New Hampshire, is a part-time police officer. I move we uh, approve the appointment of Michael Fateau of Hollis, New Hampshire, as a part-time police officer in Carlisle. Second. Is there an end date to this? Well, I mean, you, you'll appointments. make all the appointments again in June. Again, this, this is really is through, through June thirtieth, and then you'll so reappoint everyone June thirtieth. Yeah, okay. So I'd like to add the date uh, yeah. no, to right. uh, through June thirtieth, twenty nineteen. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Is this additive to the budget of the police department? Uh, I don't believe no, so. I think this is. Uh, I. I, I, I talked to I talked to John about this, and uh, it is it is a replacement. Uh, now I'm hesitating, but uh, it is not additive to his budget. No. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Kissing your eye. Reed eye. Brown eye. Oscar Lillo eye. Lewis eye. Okay. And then just uh, real quickly on the schedule. Okay. Um, just briefly, the schedule. Actually, at the finance committee meeting last night, they uh, uh, 
deferred on coming in on February 12th, and they would rather come in on the 26th. So we'll have to. Uh, I think actually I've got it down there twice. So the, yeah. the, the one on the 26th is the, is the accurate uh, coordination meeting with the Finance Committee. And also, over the two February meetings, we're going to ask the proponents of all new Warren articles to come in and, and uh, give their best pitch to the board as to why uh, their particular request is ready uh, for this annual town meeting. And that, so we'll be doing that on the 12th and this 26th? We'll be doing that at the, at the next two meetings. Right, okay. And I think uh, it, it, it helps, I think, sometimes to uh, be able to separate articles that are really ready for town meeting versus ones that are just kind of a notion at this point or mm -hmm. okay. uh, submitted as a placeholder uh, for that. Uh, we just added uh, CONSCOM again. CONSCOM on the 26th. On the 26th. Yep. Um, um, we will be having um, uh, a meeting coming up soon for interviews for the fire chief. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking that that should probably be a separate special meeting. Yep. special meeting so that we can just focus on that. It's going to be a long meeting. You know, it's going to be interviewing people. Um, obviously, we're very interested in everybody's involvement, but I think we'll separate it out from other other business. And so we'll we'll pick a different day for that once we hear from the yep. committee. search committee on stuff. So we'll probably be doing that scheduling um, offline. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tim's got my dates, right? The yes, the Euro. Okay. You're Back the twenty second. Um, uh, not not in the the formal uh, town administrator's report. Uh, I did circulate to you um, a proposal from our our licensed site professionals Wilcox and Barton regarding the uh, the fuel tank project at uh, at the fire station. Um, <coughs> You'll recall that the project was to remove two fuel tanks, which was accomplished. Uh, there was, were traces of petroleum contamination were found in the groundwater at the removal site, uh, which mandated that the town test the uh, public water supply well here at the town hall and at the fire station. Both of those tests were very positive. <coughs> no contamination was found. Out of an abundance of caution, DEP is now requiring the town to test all private wells within a 500-foot radius of the of the the spill, uh, if you will, or where the tanks were removed. So that affects some nine or ten properties. And uh, Wilcox and Barton submitted a proposal for the board uh, to provide the LSP or licensed site professional services to conduct that testing and, and provide the proper documentation to, uh, to DEP. And again, to emphasize that uh, uh, it, it's out of an abundance of caution and it's a very conservative approach. Our own wells were tested and, and uh, you know, we've, no issues were found with that. They do recommend uh, testing uh, within that 500 foot radius. So the proposal from Wilcox and Barton, I think, was for the uh, not to exceed <coughs> figure twenty-three thousand dollars to con conduct that testing, which is uh, an amount of money that uh, we didn't obviously budget for and would probably require us going to the finance committee at some point in time. But uh, it's it's not an optional uh, thing. It's been very uh, you know, strongly suggested by DEP that the town do this as a matter of due diligence, and I think it's the prudent. Uh, way to go. It's not inexpensive, but it, it's something the board, uh, you know, obviously takes seriously. And I think uh, I'd recommend uh, approval of that particular proposal uh, so that they can <coughs> begin the public notification. I think I also set the proposed public notice around to the board that, uh, you know, certainly uh, not to alarm uh, folks, but to, to again tell them that it's out of an abundance of caution that this. Testing is is being required, and we don't anticipate any any particular issues. But it's something that, uh, in order to be complete, we need to do. So, how would they um, how would they determine in, in doing these the, the the well testing? How would they determine if it was contamination in some of the areas anyway? That's if a question. If it was contamination from this tank, or 
the old MBTE contamination from what was it? That is, that's a, yeah, that, that's a question that, that we've asked, and I, I'm not sure uh, exactly the science of how they, they can determine if and when it happened and if it is related to this or not, but it's, it's all I presume the material that breaks down over time. Yeah, um, Tony. Um, Mar Mariano? Mariano uh, was at uh, one of the meetings and he was saying he was pretty sure it was not from daisies <coughs> because of the the way the, the fissures go, you know. Yeah, no, I wasn't. This. Um, I, but I wasn't worried that it was. I was worried more that if we do testing out there and there's anything found in the wells that that might be attributed to this when it's actually not. Yeah, it's, exactly, it's exactly. Um, you can't really, but they are going to do test core bores cores around as well, and the you know. Oh, it's not just well water testing. Yeah. Yeah. Not just well rotting. The yeah, yeah, there's so. there's there's solid uh, test cores uh, that are going to be tested. So, um, and the other thing that I wanted to say, a message that I have for you from the <laughs> municipal facilities committee is to please, please, please authorize sending the um, notification letter to the people that have the wells with, and it's not the properties within 500 feet, I want to specify that, it's the wells within 500 feet. So there may be, you know, there's a difference between a, in a butters list, whose properties abut the mm -hmm. fire department but, um, property, and right. those that have wells within a 500 uh, foot diameter from the, the site where the tanks were taken out. Mm -hmm. and but. The major thing is we would like to get that notification out to those folks ASAP because we don't want people to be told later that, oh, gee, we might have a problem, and, and they, they can come back to us and say, well, gee, how come you didn't tell us that sooner? Here we've been drinking this. You knew f three weeks ago, and we've been still drinking the water. Mm -hmm. um, well, we really here, don't think there's a problem because um, there was actually <coughs> something found that the um, – the fire department water, but it was less, way less than the acceptable level. Um, yeah. um, well, why are they doing the borings? I mean, the first be test would be to do your because the water, and we then be because we have been asked to do so by the DEP as so they in an abundance of caution, because mm -hmm. they also saw that you know didn't seem that doesn't make any sense. And and the um, other problem by the way with this is that because we've gone down started down this road even if the, we find nothing in all the wells around we may be testing for the next five yeah, years yeah well that's that's just it but yeah. that's yeah um uh, we have to do this yeah. and did we get the original letter from dep did we get a copy of that and i don't um i mean I we the board of selectmen no i think i think it went to the board of health board of health got it yes and did I they get, get multiple quotes? <sighs> multiple quotes? On the testing? Just, yeah. Uh, that's well, just, uh, they, 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 they did not because Barton and Wilcox, or Wilcox and Barton, they're, they're, they were the engineers on the project. On the project. So they. It just seems think. steep. I mean, the, the testing for the, the water, the eight samples, 2400 bucks, you know, I mean, that that's what those cost. It's, it's an expensive test. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. It just, it seems. The thing that makes it expensive that. is that um, it's, you know. Yeah, it's the test wells, which. I uh, oh, no, the test wells. No, yeah. that's not. Well, it's like 10 grand of the whole thing. I mean, we, um, we need to test the wells. I, you know, I, I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah. That was about $2,400, I thought. Yeah. That, for yeah, it's, it's, testing it's just the eight, so it must be eight wells. Eight wells that yeah, are eight, eight or nine. Eight 300 bucks. Yeah. That's actually eight. not too bad. It's eight. Yeah. 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 And then. 1600 bucks for somebody to go, Psh, but, um, well, no, that's yeah, literally well, what not, it is. Yeah, I know it is, yeah. but the thing is, it has to be the right somebody, uh, because well, there's... it really doesn't. I mean, because it's not biologicals. You're testing for chemicals. They're not going to contaminate it. But, but yeah. anyway, but it's more so, I think we should get a, another couple of quotes. Um, I, and I, I'd like to see the letter, too. I mean... The EP? Yeah, if we could. I mean, boring is just... It, okay. One concern that I had was that... The letter that uh, they had planned to send to the eight people who were within the 500 foot uh, radius uh, said that there's a problem with BT. Would it be something TE? When I get the uh, MBTE. MBTE. Yeah. MBTE. 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 Um, all that will do is raise questions on those eight people. So what is it? What's what's the you know how bad is it? 
I, I think it might you know, raise more questions than necessary, potentially, and uh, I think we need to, to know how that would be answered or addressed in any notification so that we'd minimize the angst, if you will. Yeah, well, we could have a meeting. I mean, the Board of Health could hold a meeting and have everybody in. I mean, I think that'd be the quickest way to do it. You have a professional here that would state what they're testing for, why they're testing for it. It's yeah. been referred to the Board of Health and the Water Quality Committee, West Subcommittee. Oh, okay. And yeah. They're the ones well, that might are be even basically though. handling this. Okay, yeah, they might be even better. So I, I would like to propose that we split this out. But, you know, I think I think it would be good to read the letter. Mm -hmm. I think that you know it, it would be good to you know maybe get more um, more quotes on the, the boring. But I think that you know going ahead with the well testing. Yeah, I think that we um, need to do. You know, you know in, in getting this letter out. Yeah. Um, we have to get the letter. Out. That's yeah. job yeah. one. If there if there may be we contaminated can't. wells out there, we should know now. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I I, I propose that. Uh, we go ahead and authorize Tim to move forward on the well testing. Mm -hmm. yep. right. Yeah. And, and, and authorizing the Board of Health to send out the letter. Yeah. And, and also, too, can we find out where the samples are going to be sent, what lab? Okay. Um, I thought we had that was in there. I think it just says professional service. I don't think it says the actual lab. I'm, not, I'm looking at the letter now, not the. Hmm. Let me go back yeah. to that. Yeah, what do they say? No. <coughs> okay, so yep. Tim, you have authorization uh, to contract to split for the, well. the cost out. Yeah, so and, and well go ahead and contract only. for that and mm -hmm. uh, the Board of Health can send out the letter. Okay. Okay. Good. We have more questions on a more detailed testing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There? Yep, yep. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Ping ponging and from late to early to late to early. <laughs> okay. Well, at least Household we got that out of the way. way. Household Recycling Committee. Who's here from the Household Recycling Committee? Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> how many, how many, just raise your hand if you're on the committee. There's three and myself. Okay, so four, okay. Uh, just so I can get an idea, how many are here because they're, they, they want to listen to the Household Recycling Committee report? Okay, okay. all right, great, all right, thank you. Take it away. All right. Uh, my name is Rob Perry. I'm the chairman of the Carlisle, House <coughs> Carlisle Household Recycling Committee. Uh, oh, there's what there. First of all, I'd like to uh, just uh, acknowledge, uh, um, well, just so people know, we had we had submitted a uh, solid waste report to the selectmen, and uh, which we'll be discussing tonight. I just wanted to do a brief acknowledgement of some of the um, folks who had helped out with uh, generating that over the past year. Um, uh, of course, the committee members, uh, Dan Skolton and Bob Walhagen, who are here tonight, and uh, also Lana Zamaro, uh, who did most of the uh, editing and re-editing and re-editing. <laughs> <laughs> Much thanks to her for that. And um, also, um, we had assistance from uh, uh, John Height and Kirsty Pecky from the Zero Waste Project Director and Senior Fellow of the Conservation Law Foundation. Also, uh, Carolyn Dan and Julia Green. Carolyn Dan was the, who are the uh, Mass Department of Environmental Protection Municipal Assistance and Waste Reduction Coordinator for our region. Um, Carolyn Dan was the former one, and Julia Green is the current one, and uh, from DEP, and she's here, actually here tonight. Um, and also, um, we had assistance from um, Deborah Bentley from the Energy Task Force, and also um, 
from Claude Von Rosken, a former member of the Energy Task Force, um, who uh, helped us gather uh, information and statistics and uh, helped us put together our slide presentation. So um, much thanks to all those people who uh, helped us out. I also like to thank uh, the residents of Carlisle, who, uh, as it says in our report, have been doing the right thing at the transfer station for quite a while now. Um, transfer station has enabled the town to easily and conveniently uh, take care of their trash and the recyclables. And um, I particularly want to thank uh, Gary Davis and his staff, um, who just do a great job of operating the transfer station um, and the great job we've been doing so far. The reason we're here tonight is um, we've reached uh, a plateau or a ceiling or however you want to look at it, but uh, for many years now, actually decades, uh, the amount of our solid waste and our recyclable amount of recyclables hasn't changed a lot. <clears throat> it takes uh, a lot of effort on the part of the residents uh, to put in place uh, the concept of uh, reduce and reuse and recycling and composting and we m appreciate all their efforts but in order to make substantial improvements we, we need to consider making uh, some changes to our system that can ab enable us to do that a lot better. Um, we're looking forward to uh, working with you folks, the selectmen and uh, Gary Davis at the uh, DPW and the, his staff to um, hopefully impl implement some changes over the coming months um, as we work these things out. And uh, as you'll see uh, in the slide presentation that we're, we're going to present, um, we want to propose some um, some changes to significantly improve our uh, trash and recycling situation in town. Um, we have uh, Julia Green from the DEP, the re our regional recycling coordinator, with us. She's just going to uh, share uh, DEP's perspective for a couple of minutes with you. And then uh, Claude Von Rosken is going to go through the slide presentation. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I come yeah, you have to because we're... I didn't know I was going to speak, but... <laughs> so, uh, Surprise! Surprise. <laughs> So I'm a municipal assistance coordinator. I work um, with the municipal um, s solid waste uh, program for Mass Department of Environmental Protection. And um, it's all about waste reduction. So we hear about recycling, we hear about composting, we hear about all our waste bins, but it's all got to do with waste reduction, um, waste reduction in the state of Massachusetts. Um, every 10 years, um, Mass DEP puts out another 10-year uh, master plan. Um, we're behind on the master plan that was written in 2010, and um, we're coming up and we're actually writing the master plan for 2020. So um, um, we have decreased um, muni uh, municipal solid waste or solid waste across the state, but not as much as the planning had anticipated in 2010. So it, um, in light of that, too, is um, we're uh, up against uh, closing landfills. So several have already closed in the past 10 years, and four more will close by 2021. Also in the uh, 2020 master plan, um, they're projecting that we will be exporting more waste to other states because we just don't have the capacity in Massachusetts. And that will either be landfilled or it'll be incinerated at a waste to energy plant out, outside of the state of Massachusetts. <clears throat> so I tell you all of this because the state of Massachusetts hires people like me. There are eight of us in the state of Massachusetts to work with um, several cities and towns. I have 36 cities and towns on waste reduction. So, um, so the state wants to see that and wants to see every city and town 
putting forward plans and then trying to meet those goals too on waste reduction. So um, that's all I wanted to say is kind of to give the broad overview of what's happening um, and um, uh, how, how Carlisle interacts with the state and vice versa. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Claude, is this the same presentation that you emailed to us? Uh, yeah, with a very minor change. Okay. I had a conversation with Gary Davis this morning, and uh, he had looked it over and had some input, so I changed the little thing. I'll highlight those. So I want to talk about solid waste. And I'd like to hear Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot the microphone. Okay, I'll, I'll try to stay on mic. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk about solid waste, not about recycling. So <laughs> this is a conversation focused on the trash part, not the other part. So um, I don't want to run over the as Julia said, landfills are closing. Um, there were 900 in 1920. There's only 20 today. You know, there are more are closing, and only uh, Carlisle's closed in 1972. Um, but People say, well, wait a minute, we don't need landfills, we burn our trash. Well, there's a 10 to 1 reduction that you get by burning it, but our 2,000 tons end up still being 200 tons of ash, which is rather nastier than uh, the original uh, stuff, although it weighs less and it's smaller volume. So um, as you can see, the state um, managed to reduce over the last, over this 10-year plan, this is older data, so it's from 2016. The state reduced things by 14% in that same time period. We only went down 3%. Um, but, you know, people ask, don't we do a good job of recycling? Well, yes, we're 37th in the state in terms of our amount that we recycle per household. So, you know, that's it's pretty good. 300? Oh, it's just right there. Sorry. 283. So 283 towns that are reporting. There are 351 towns in Massachusetts. So. We don't have data for all the towns. This is the official state data. Um, how do we compare in solid waste tonnage, though? That's sort of the other half of the equation. And it, Carlisle's all the way there on the right. This is tons per household served by the particular service these towns have. Some of them are curbside. Some of them are transfer stations. And you can see we're at the higher end of the spectrum. Um, as a matter of fact, if you rank all the towns that report, we're fifth in terms of tonnage per person, per household, I should say. So um, we're maybe not so good in that area. Um, so how do towns get lower numbers than what we've got? Well, uh, the sort of best practices is something called pay as you throw. And it's uh, basically a system where the users have to pay for what they use. Um, and uh, it's implemented often with a special kind of bag that you buy. And in order to uh, throw away your stuff at the transfer station, you have to put your trash in that bag. And um, in Littleton, they do this. In Bolton, they do this. Um, in Acton, they do this. And you go to Market Basket, or in our case, perhaps Ferns, and you buy these bags. They come in 33-gallon sizes, which is your typical trash can, 15 and 8-gallon. So you can, and the price varies accordingly. Um, and pay as you throw is sort of an interdependent um, comprehensive solution in the sense that you get benefits by reducing the solid waste tonnage that can enable you to do other things um, and all the pieces work together and it's hard to sort of take just one aspect of this and implement it piecemeal. Um, so, now, this is, what I'm talking about here is a proposal, right? This is not, we're not here to say, okay, the plan, this is the plan, we're going, it's going to, we're going to do it in April, April 1st, you know, April Fool's Day, we're going to change everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is, this is the first part of a conversation that's going to start, and we're going to get community input. And so this is a proposal based on what we've observed as best practices visiting transfer stations in Littleton, in Bolton, in Lincoln, in um, Acton, and gathering data about other towns that do curbside and so on and so forth. So, um, but it's still just an initial proposal. So, you know, what we could do at our transfer stations, we could buy a, 
a booth like this. We can put a computer in it. This is typically what the other towns do. And then you, you actually buy your, or, uh, the, um, well, you acquire, in our case, we're thinking of a zero cost transfer station sticker. So the sticker would come down from $25 to zero. You would get 20 free bags, 20 33 gallon bags, 40, depending on what you prefer, 40 uh, 15 gallon bags or 80 eight gallon bags. Not any combination of those, but you have three choices. And, um, and a free transfer station sticker. And then um, you'd have a nice booth where you could get those transfer station sticker and the voucher to get your free bags at Ferns. Um, the bags, additional bags you would be buying at Ferns as well, not at the transfer station. Um, we would also have a composting program. 30% of solid waste is, in many households, is the, um, that don't do composting, is the actual food that you throw in the trash. And if you compost that, you can get rid of 30% of your uh, solid waste right off the bat. So we would have bins at, this is done in Acton, there's a picture of how it's done, and you can put your uh, food waste, including meat and bones, so pretty much everything would be able to go into those bins. And um, you wouldn't have to use these bags for that. You could use any container you'd like, dump it in there. Um, so how does this benefit me? Well, you know, uh, you have a free transfer station sticker, <coughs> less congestion at the transfer station. Uh, we're talking about commingling steel, aluminum, and plastic into a compactor so that your unloading would be easier instead of having to reach up and <coughs> push your plastic up high and get it into a bin. You could put it down low, like the way you do your trash. Um, the property tax burden uh, would be reduced 120 k the first year. Um, and then 150 k annually thereafter. Uh, this is a combination of the savings from having less tipping fees and transportation fees, but also the bag revenue uh, would, uh, bring in those, would bring in those savings. And um, so one of the big questions that people ask is, well, what happens to all this waste that supposedly disappears when you go to pay as you throw? And um, there's no definitive answer in the sense that, well, we know 12% disappears because of this and so on and so forth. But this is a slide that sh talks about the different ways that people end up reducing their contribution to solid waste. And you know, composting is a big one, certainly. But there are other alternatives, um, like repair and reuse, donations to charity. Um, recycling does go up with pay as you throw. So that's another aspect of it. Uh, but the tonnage that you see in the recycling is not equal to the reduction in, uh, it's less than the reduction in the solid waste. So there are other things going on. Um, and then the swap shed is one uh, sort of difficult item in a pay-as-you-throw environment, and towns deal with it in different ways. In Littleton, uh, you can still put stuff in the uh, swap shed, but you're not allowed to put in uh, certain items that you would have to pay for. We haven't talked about the bulk items yet, which I believe are on this slide here. So what if it doesn't fit in a trash bag? You have uh, a list here. This is a typical list. It's from the uh, uh, Littleton uh, transfer station. And so you, depending on what it is, you have to buy a ticket, and you buy that ticket at the transfer station, and then you're entitled to either drop off your CRT or your propane tank or your tire or your appliance, microwave oven, and so on. So the swap shed um, in Littleton, you're not allowed to put these things in the swap shed, or you can, but you still have to pay this, the sticker. Uh, if you want to have, if you have a game of Monopoly or books or whatever, you can put that in the swap shed. That's no problem. Um, and uh, then here's a proposed layout. Now I spoke with Gary Davis, and um, he made some adjustments to this. Uh, he, this proposal here talks about using the, our existing compactors. Uh, and repurposing one that's now used for trash to do plastic, aluminum, and tin. But he wants to have four because he feels he needs two, and I, I think he's right in visiting other transfer stations, namely Bolton and um, Littleton. They use two trash compactors, and they serve similar amounts, almost identical numbers of households. So um, we would add a fourth. Gary's proposing adding a fourth compactor here in the area where the uh, tin and plastic is, and then that would become a commingled compactor. 
Um, the other thing Gary mentioned today is that he felt that some of our fees, especially for couches and other bulky furniture, was too high because at $70 a ton, he thought that it was rather inexpensive for us to, depose, uh, to dispose of them at the incinerator. Uh, but other towns all seem to have these higher prices for couches and things like that. And so there must be some reason for it that we should probably look into before we go with Gary's recommendation. Um, and uh, then I think, oh, the other thing that he pointed out was that the swap shed, um, at the end of the day, they clean it out, but they do recycle everything that can be recycled that's left in the swap shed. Mm -hmm. So if there's, you know, books there, if there's... Um, you know, plastic things, if there's small appliances that are mostly metal, they put that in the metal recycling and so on and so forth. So only the things that are not recyclable are put in the dumpster. Um, so I, that, that, was, that was a change from the presentation that we had earlier. Is it emptied every night or just one night a week? I thought it was I one believe, night a week. I believe it's every night, but uh, um, I saw them uh, emptying it after Thursday. On a Friday morning, I was there, and they were emptying it. Okay. Um, and Thursday's a slow day, so... I believe it is every, I'm sure if there's a snow day or, you know, they're out plowing, that's probably one of the things they drop off the list, but mm -hmm. um, I think they tend to do it every day. Um, so, and then the other thing I think that we're, uh, we need to do is uh, have some regulations. I, I think the regulations right now are very sparse for the transfer station, and when you go to pay as you throw, I think that you need to sort of spell out certain things. And um, this is an example set of regulations that Littleton has. Um, you know, I'm sure we can craft our own set modeled on, you know, Littleton, Bolton, um, Acton. Uh, but uh, you definitely want to spell things out. Um, and then I have a bunch of appendices that are there to answer questions, really. I don't want to go through them. Um, but I just, you know, want to open it up and see if anybody has any questions. Um, of course, I have a bunch. Um, okay. Hang on one second. I want to, I want to, I want to um, let Nathan the... Nathan Brown is the chairman, so... Right, so I, I want to open it up to the board of I'm not the one first. who uh, um, is in charge of the meeting. So just one question. You said that the proposed regulations uh, were samples from what town? Littleton. I believe um, that one is actually from Littleton. Uh, why... why uh, stickers at the transfer station only? Uh, well, in, I've talked with the dispatch multiple times, and they seem to be very uh, unhappy about being in charge of selling transfer station uh, stickers. Um, and it seems that that's the practice that other towns use. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm sure, I mean, we can do it any way we want. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, th this is just a proposal, so yeah, uh, I'd just it just seems that to that be a, would a practice that's reduce common. Reduce the likelihood of getting one, just because it's, you know, you can swing by at the police station any time you're thinking of it, right? And you don't have to wait for the transfer station to be open. On the mm -hmm. other hand, you can go to the swap, uh, to the uh, transfer station with a car loaded with junk that you're going to throw out and buy your sticker. I mean, because yeah. you're going to be there anyway. So, which you can't do now because sometimes you go there and you go, oh, my stickers. Yeah, to, I, I think it's convenient. Um, the booth, yeah. you know, would be set up so that, you know, it's a nice environment. You can walk in. It's not a cave. Yeah, no, I was reacting more to only. Oh, not oh only. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so I, I don't want to monopolize this. Uh, anybody have any questions? And then I'll jump into more. I'm curious. How do, how do other places determine households? One of the big things, I mean, Carlisle, we're all individual homes. Household's easy. What do you do when you've got apartment houses? Do they, how do they well, it, account for that? When, and I, I just, I'm looking at the, the solid waste numbers. Right. Is, is one of the reasons we're high because every household actually gets counted versus an apartment house where everybody goes into a commercial dumpster? Well, those numbers that I showed were households served. So if you look at the numbers from the state, they have a column for no total number of households and then the number of households that are served by whatever program. It is transfer station or curbside recycling. And so I'm talking about solid waste per household served. In our case, it's most households. Mm -hmm. You know, because like you say, we don't have a lot of apartment buildings. We do have Village Court. They have their own dumpster, I believe. Um, so, so, that does, so, they, so apartment houses aren't included in those numbers at all? Uh, not included in those okay. numbers. 
That's correct. Those are just transfer station numbers divided by, by the number in, of people by individual who buy dump homes. stickers. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. presumably that's the population that is served, quote unquote, served by the transfer station. Thank you. So I have a question about the free stickers. Currently, you get your first sticker, and then uh, your second car costs ten dollars. Ten dollars. But let's. So I have two cars. I want to have two stickers, right? Am I going to get forty bags? No, 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 no. The bags. <laughs> Just no, keep no, buying no, no, no. cars. No. Yeah, that's right. that's, that was kind of more or less People my. We'll buy well, extra cars. The, 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 well, cars listen, my around. neighbor has five cars because they've got twins. They've got their two cars, and for some reason they have a, you know, an extra one in the in the driveway. You know, if they. So no, that's why I'm asking. Be, you know, per address, bags. it would be per physical address. <laughs> okay. So there might be an issue where somebody has two households in one house, but usually then they would have two addresses, A and B, or something like that. But no, the no, the intention okay, is it's, it's one set of bags per household, and so if you want to get, you, you only get one voucher per household. All right, but you could could you get two stickers so that you don't have to choose yeah. which car you're coming in? You know. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, there's no reason why. So, for instance, in Acton, they actually have a computer in the little shack, and they have uh, they use QuickBooks, and you know they type it in, so they know the address, the plate number, and so on. Uh -huh. So they can do a quick search and see. Okay, well, well, that address we already bought one. Okay, so you're not getting the voucher with this with that one. Yeah, you'll get a sticker, but not a voucher. Yeah. Okay, got it. But you want to get so many bags anyway. Well, after that, well, you can Kate buy is more. Well, saying that people will try to go in with each car to get. Oh, game uh, the system for each car. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> game the system. Yeah. I'm concerned. Oh, no, that's okay. I'd, I'd like to just, I just want to make sure that all the boys selectmen have a chance oh, to ask sorry. questions sorry. first. No, I just want to ask about the staffing levels. Have you, have you checked with Gary about that? And then also, too, yeah. I, you know, just in terms of square footage, you know, I don't know how big the Littleton area is. It just, it seems like half the time you go to the transfer station, there's a guy there but where, you know? Yeah. And sometimes they're in a swap sh shed, sometimes they're moving something around. Um, you know, I just, I wonder, have the other towns had issues policing this? You know, I mean, if well, somebody goes in with one page, you throw back kind of on top, and the other, you know what I mean? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody's not watching, right? Right, so part of the proposal would be um, that we would get a grant from the state, uh, this typically is the case, uh, for six weeks of additional personnel, you know, up to, you know, two extra people, Gary, well, the other towns that do pay as you throw seem to staff with two people yeah. whenever they're open. Yeah. Lincoln, which doesn't do pay as you throw, they have two people on Saturday and only one person on the one week there they're open, but they're not pay as you throw, so it's, and, so, which is kind of our system. Right. So I think we would have to increase staffing levels, but we have staffing, staff hours are at 36, right. and if I analyze the other places, and we're actually high in terms of staffing hours, even compared to pay as you throw, because the other pay, the other transfer stations that do pay as you throw don't have as many hours. Oh, okay. We're open nine hours three days a week. Yeah. A lot of the other ones sometimes four <laughs> hours on one day, and you know depending on the day. So we might end up cutting back on some hours, but staffing at two, mm -hmm. uh, any time it's open. Yeah. You know. And then your other question was, uh, you no, had sort just, of two. Yeah. No. I mean that was mainly it was staffing, policing, it, staffing, yeah, staffing, and then yeah. just being able. No, to I have a little spreadsheet that shows the different towns and number of people, hours they're open, staff hours, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've, I've got it on this. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Um, so, uh, so I have a, a, a bunch of questions about the report, which wasn't wasn't shown here. Um, one of the things, is, and, you, and you said that the report was was more about the waste, and and you know, and I think that there's a lot of really great things in here. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure that right now I'm willing to say I support pay as you throw, um, but I, but I do think that there's a lot of really great things that we could adopt that are in the uh, the report that you provided and uh, in, in your presentation. Um, and so, but one thing that kind of jumped out at me in, in, in the report was uh, the, um, in talking about the recycled, recyclable materials, um, you know, there's, there's a total revenue of a lot of these things. Um, and the largest tonnage um, item that we have is the construction debris. And it's also the one that costs us money and it costs us a lot of money. And I know that there isn't any 
real uh, enforcement of anybody paying any money to throw things into the construction debris bin. Um, and so I was just wondering what what might you know did did you as a committee look at all at what we might be able to do about that construction debris thing? You know, like is it you know should the town be paying for contractors to come in and throw away construction debris? You know, like you know professional contractors. You know, you know I could see it if it's a you know uh, I don't know somebody just demolished a part of their porch or something. It's their own house. You know, providing a place to throw that away at a fee. Um, but the whole town is paying for contractors to go in and throw, and it's it's expensive, and it is by far our largest number um, when it comes to the waste that we're getting rid of. Yeah. Well, let uh, let me just say that uh, Lana was the primary person who generated the report, so I, I don't want to take any credit for that. <laughs> um, so, uh, but. I, I helped edit it, um, you know, or I contributed a little bit to it. Um, I can say that the other towns um, all seem to basically ban any construction waste. That they are not taking construction waste. That seems to be a best practice. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. I think that would be a big first step in reducing our numbers. Um, and there are alternatives for small projects, like you mentioned about a porch. Uh, there's these Baxters, they're called. Um, it's a, it's a big canvas bag you buy at a hardware store uh, for small money, well, $20, $30, and then you buy a coupon for the pickup later. And, you know, when you're ready, you call up and they, they come and just take it away. And it's very easy to manage because it's just a piece of canvas. Um, so I think we would direct people to that kind of service. And for contractors, you know, they should probably be buying dumpsters uh, okay. and, and yeah. you know that's what right. most and just to be clear that's not reducing the waste obviously there's still there's still waste but it, yes. but it is getting the town out of the business of paying to get rid of that waste well also there's you're also putting an incentive on the person who is generating the waste to generate less they might think about recycling some of it uh, in a way in, in other words if if you have free ability to get rid of construction debris then you're not going to be as careful as if you have to pay for it. Right, right. So that that was just that was one thing that kind of jumped out at me was, uh, yes, you know, ma making sure that in in some way we we address that. Um, and then you know, the other thing that that I really liked about this and and you know understand like the the amount that's charged maybe you know we need to talk about more. But I, I like the idea of you, you you know starting to pay for the larger items, yeah. you know. Uh, and even if it goes in the swap shed, right? Because if, if uh, I think that right now a lot of garbage goes in the, the swap shed, um, and you know it's it's really I think it you know makes people feel better I guess, but you know it it doesn't work. You know why is it in the swap shed? And I think that you know, uh, you know the idea of if you're if you're dropping off a refrigerator, which I need to do soon, um, if, you, if you're dropping off a refrigerator or propane tanks or tires or something like that, I think there should be a fee um, for that. And I, you know, I don't know how, you know, how we involve Gary's team to, to collect that fee, but I do think that that would drive some things down. Um, uh, you know, uh, my guess is, is that we get things from outside of town just because it's free here. Right. Oh, I can drop it off at my transfer station, yep. and um, and so so I, I I like that aspect of what you're doing, um, and and so what I'm trying to what I'm trying to do is see is are there things that can really help us reduce our waste, um, going stopping short of pay at your th pay as you throw and see how well we do, and then do something that's more complicated like the the pay as you throw. Um, you know, I think that when you first come into town, I think I think I've got it down now, but it's hard to know where to throw what, yes. right? And I think there could be so much better signage, and you know, so if if you know, oh, over there I can throw away metal things. Well, now now maybe you're gonna walk over there and throw it over there rather than throw it in the garbage one because you didn't see, you know, you know where plastics are, you know where glass is. Where's the metal one? You know, it kind of it's actually one of those dumpsters that's over in the corner that looks like it's sitting there waiting to be put into the middle when the other one fills. And so I think there could be so much better signage 
and, and just education around it. I think that people in Carlisle really want to do the right thing. Um, and then, uh, um, can I? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think Gary was very enthusiastic about the notion of charging for the sort of bulky items, the one, you know, which end up costing him like tires, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, TVs, those are two big ones, and so on. Um, but one thing that uh, is tricky is that you do, I think, have to staff up. Like you said, if you have only one person, it's hard for them to keep track of, oh, where's that TV, you know, I have to also manage this dumpster over here. And now we're adding personnel, and we will get presumably an income stream from, you know, selling the vouchers for these items. But I don't know if it's enough to offset the thing. That's why, in some sense, the pay-as-you-throw system is a little bit um, somewhat of an all-or-nothing approach because it's, it's hard to get the staffing up without the financial benefit that you get from, you know, the backs. So that's something that's tricky. Uh, and, and from yep. what I've seen, the other towns tend to do it. All, uh, Tim, in Littleton, did they implement it in a phased way or did they? Pay as you throw? Pay as you throw. No, it, it was kind of one day it was pay as you throw. I totally get that. Then. And I think yeah. that there's, there, there are, there are things that we could try to do. I mean, we'd have to run the numbers, right? Yes. There are things that we could try to do as far as, you know, you know, maybe maybe people would be willing to pay a little bit more for that dump sticker if it meant that they didn't didn't have to go through, uh, you know, the the garbage bag, um, pay as you throw thing. And, uh, you know, I do think that you know we would get, you know, we would certainly get more revenue by doing propane tanks and tires and 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 things like that. Um, so I guess just, you know. I think this is a great report, um, but I, you know, I, I, I'm just wondering if there can be some kind of a of a middle ground where there's more signage, more uh, more education for people about how to do it, um, and 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 this and the signage in a way that you know encourages people to do it. Like you know, if if you you know a lot of restaurants you go to now, you know, you, you it's kind of like. You know, it says, oh, glass, recycle glass here, or, you know, compost here, or landfill, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it makes, oh, wait, maybe I better separate these things out because, you know, of the landfill. Um, I, I do like the idea of the encouraging composting to get that number, you know, get that weight down. Um, I think that people, you know, people might, you know, my across the street neighbor pays a monthly fee to compost. You know, they come up and they come with a bucket and, you know, so I, I think that people would compost. Um, I do like the idea of the larger items, even if it goes in the swap shed, um, and then somehow dealing with that contractor <clears throat> thing. Yeah, my initial meeting with Gary, uh, he was definitely uh, uh, wanted to do a phased approach. But I think that from what I've seen at the other towns, and uh, because there's also an educational component to this, and so if you have a kind of piecemeal approach, it might. It, I think it's a little bit harder to keep up a, a program of saying, okay, well, you know, it's going to change like this, and then it's going to change like this, and, you know. See, I'm not talking phased. Uh, what, yeah. I'm, what I'm talking about is let's make improvements mm -hmm. and see if we can get there and how far we can get without doing the pay-as-you-throw. Yeah, and I then evaluate it um, in a year or two and see, oh, well, do we really, you know, may maybe we do have to do the pay-as-you-throw because we didn't reduce our waste to the level where we wanted to. I, I guess I'm not in all in agreement with you. I say you do the Band-Aid approach because what you're talking about ain't going to work. And it won't work because it doesn't have the incentive. And the incentive is you are sort of uh, rationed as to how much the town will support your throwing out. If you want to waste that or waste more or not do it, then it's going to cost you and that's what it, the incentive is. I disagree, um, so, though, those, because look, those, we're number 37 sticker, in recycling. I don't, I don't the, think that... Yeah, but we need more incentive yet. And the sticker is free. The bags are free to a certain number. And then after that, if you're going to do more than that, you pay for it. It's not... It's, it's, and in a way, pay as you throw is almost a misnomer. misnomer um, because we're talking about paying as you throw the big items, really. We're not talking about pay as you throw your trash. But the, the but that would that would support my argument. Yeah, but well, doing paying for things like tires and propane tanks and TVs doesn't reduce solid waste. No, it just it just you just charge you pay for it now. That's right. all. Uh, it goes somewhere else. Right. Uh, 
Go ahead. You have I just stepped up as a member of the recycling committee because Lana Zamaro on the recycling committee. A, a point of confusion, I think, is the uh, construction demo and demolition debris. That is not part. What is what gets counted as part of household trash is what goes into the incinerator. The C and D is diverted to Devon's, where it is handled. Okay, so I think it's important to be clear about what the household tonnage uh, is. And we didn't, in the um, slide deck, we didn't show the map of how we look <laughs> compared to all the other towns. Uh, it's bright red. We've gone up to a, a brighter red of color, which is a higher level of tonnage, not a huge number, because we were close to that anyway. But um, I think that what Kate, uh, Kate's point is that there, what has been shown to work in community after community, 147 to be exact at this point, is that incentive program because people pay closer attention to what they're throwing out. It's, it's a pretty simple calculation from that point of view. Um, the other aspect around pay as you throw is it's a, it's a form of monitoring, frankly, because the bags are very distinctive for the town. And yeah, you could bury some bags, I guess, under a bag, but uh, it gets harder to, to kind of cheat, basically. So it would be a way of monitoring who's actually using our transfer station and throwing their trash there, because they'd have to have a bag in order to be able to do that. So I think those are some of the reasons why a pay-as-you-throw system is very effective. So Carrie, do you have any comments? Uh, well, Claude and I have had a sort of a exchange of ideas and views and data <laughs> over the last couple of days. And uh, Claude, would you mind if I shared uh, that, those emails with uh, my fellow selectmen? No, please, please. Okay, why don't I just do that rather than take the time here? But if I'll, uh, I'll uh, send a copy of the email to Jen and she can distribute it if, uh, so you can take a look at my comments. She's nodding okay. Uh, <laughs> Basically, there are two dimensions to this. One is cost to the town. The other is reduction of waste, of solid waste materials. And we can get to both of those in a couple of different ways, I think. And I think Claude may agree with that. Uh, but it's just a strategy of what the town will willingly accept because um, it, it does represent a change in the way we're doing things, uh, no matter what we do. You know to get to those two objectives of cost and reduction of solid waste. Yeah. With, without the pay as you throw, for instance, what's my incentive to use the black earth bins? Right, you know. Well, what's your incentive to put your plastic in the plastic bin right now? There is no incentive. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. and sometimes I, if I don't really feel like rinsing it out, I don't. <laughs> oh. so, there's, there's our problem. Uh, <laughs> this is televised, you know. Too many cars. Know it. There's I'm two or three people watching. <laughs> you know, the greasier it is, or if it's smeared with peanut butter. Well, peanut butter is um, a tough. You know, yeah. um, if I don't feel like putting it in the dishwasher this time, I might just throw it out. Um, whereas if I were, uh, if I have a certain amount of volume that I can now throw out. I'll be way <laughs> more careful about it. <laughs> yeah, this proposal, um, basically, in the big picture, it divides the cost of the transfer station into two pieces. Normally, it's pretty much 100% paid for out of property taxes. There's a nominal cost of the dumb sticker. But the, the new approach is to say, OK, the town will pay for half of it, but you're going to pay the other half of it. And, but most importantly, not as one lump sum, like by buying a $125 dumb sticker. We're saying you're going to pay for it, you know, on a per bag basis because that creates the incentive. And you're right, people do recycle now, but you do see an increase in the amount of recycling when you go to pay as you throw. So there's a population there that is going to behave differently as a result of this incentive. And that's the, the sort of magic of the scheme. And the other thing is that it's not just recycling because there are other alternatives like composting, as Kate pointed out, there, people will be composting who wouldn't otherwise do that. And there's 
you know, well, let's not take that couch to the transfer station. Let's take it over to the Acton, uh, where they the do home. the home goods, I think it's uh, called. Uh, yeah. Um, household Kate's goods. Kate's going to be putting all her in the, compost in the metal cans. <laughs> <laughs> I will. So, so I, I just want to I just want to yeah. open it up because, you know, we're, we're running late. I just yeah. want to ask anybody. So, so we, we are, I think, going to have to discuss this at another Board of Selectmen meeting. Um, because we're, we've run out of time, but um, I'll just take a couple of questions because there have been people putting up their hands and I haven't been acknowledging them. Uh, so I think, oh, sir, you put up your hand first a while ago. Okay, I just had a quick question. It sounds to me like there's no point putting something in the swap shed at 4.55 on Saturday. Correct. Correct. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, I'm getting a, we, we need set you on the microphone. So you have to come up and ask. Sorry. Uh, you have to come so up here. No point. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. You still, oh, you still have to come to the microphone. If you could come up and, and state your name and address. Yeah. State your name and address. And uh, David Erickson, 237 Fisk Street. Uh, so it sounds to me like there's no point putting anything in the swap shed at 4.55 on Saturday. That's correct. Sounds right. <laughs> if you really want it to be recycled, you go early in the morning. Uh, yes. Bonnie, you, you, yeah, you have here. to go up. Oh, sorry. Bonnie Mishkalzi, 447 Cross Street, and I have been going to the dump since 1966, so I've seen a lot of things. And one thing in the dim past that might solve a little bit of the swap shed problem, people used to be very upset that other people who didn't have dump stickers or weren't using anything else but the swap shed were allowed to come in and take things away. but that gets rid of a lot of stuff. So if there was a designated time when anybody from anywhere could come and come to the rich town of Carlisle and pick out stuff from the swap shed, that might, it used to be a problem, but now it could be a solution. Okay, thank you. Yes. Nancy, you have to go to the microphone. Nancy Cronenberg, 152 Wolfrock. Have you got any data on what people do when they decide, oh, I don't want to put it in the bag because I paid for the bag, aside from recycling? It makes them, I can see it makes them more apt to recycle, but <laughs> anything else? Well, I had a slide there with a list of you know, possible. Okay, I guess it went by real fast. What were yeah. some of the things on there? Well, you know, the, the home goods, act, you know, giving stuff away, uh, Chari charitable contributions. Um, you know, some people may use an appliance manu uh, delivery person. They, they'll take old appliances, you know, for a fee. So people opt to do that rather than bring it to the transfer station. There's a whole host of composting. Um, uh, you know, it's not clear what exactly all the behaviors are. No, as far as we know, nobody's done a study to sort of actually like observe people as as if they were like lab rats and you know see what they do, <laughs> but. Um, there's a list of conjectures about what happens. But empirically, there's a lot of evidence, you know, 147 communities, 44% solid waste reduction when you do pay as you throw. Okay, Debbie, one last question. <coughs> um, sorry, Debbie Bentley, Hill Road. Uh, it's more of a statement just to remind everybody, this is a car, our carbon footprint issue. Um, and we have 12 years in which to really do something substantial. Reducing our trash makes everybody aware that everything they consume has a carbon footprint, it actually starts to reduce our carbon footprint. So it's actually, uh, we have to consume less um, rather than actually worry about our trash. If we consume less, we naturally have less waste. Uh, Lana and I have actually written a website called Zero Waste Carlisle to help people uh, reduce their waste. Um, it, it's up there as a sort of beta trial, but uh, certainly I, somebody can contact me and I can link, uh, Put it on, give them the link. Okay. Well, All right, I'm going to break with just website. David, David, and then. David Friedman Hutchins Road. Three quick things. Um, we've been talking about this solar array um, at the transfer station. And I think somebody, these two groups should get together because we should see, you know, you, you look at the aerial view with nothing in the way. It'd be interesting for us to get together and see how these things can coordinate with each other and figure out how, because you're going to have a different flow with pay-as-you-throw and you're going to have a different throw with this solar array. And so I think 
before you move ahead with either of these things, you need to see how they, they work with each other. That's one. Um, second thing is, I think, for you to move ahead, you're obviously, as Kerry pointed out, going to need to look at this from a financial standpoint. And I think what they should be asked to do is to talk to Gary and really work out what the staffing is, because clearly, as Luke said, you know, you go there and you don't know where the person is, but you, you're really going to need multiple people there all the time, because you need somebody in the booth all the time to be able to do the stickers, and you need somebody at the drop-off place for the big things all the time to make sure people are doing what they're doing and somebody who's watching every one of the things that you can put bags in to make sure only bags are put in. And I think you really need a detailed, you know, ask Gary to really look at this very clearly and, and lay out what the staff is going to do and, and understand that. Last thing is what we can do now while we talk about it is make sure in the Mosquito and I think that, you know, Household Recycling Committee get out that we are fifth in the state in tonnage and that map that I've seen with the color on it get that out there and, you know, let's just shame people a little bit and maybe people will feel like let's do better in the meantime while you work it out. All right, thank you. All right. Um, so I think, uh, yes. Cindy Nock, 41 Canterbury Court. Um, I just want to say three things. One is, um, first time I heard about this, Lana told me about two years ago about I'll pay as you throw, pay as, what is it, pay as you throw as the way to go. and. Um, and she explained it all to me, and I was very much against it, and I just thought it was the dumbest thing I ever heard. But, um, <laughs> but in the meantime, I've talked to people, and a lot of people that live in pay as you throw communities, and they say, oh, yeah, it's the, it's, it's the way to go. So I've changed my mind about it, and now I'm 100% behind it. Um, the other point I want to make is um, there was in the, re in the report or in, the, um, in this uh, PowerPoint, you have a thing on about cameras that are being installed, and um, I wanted to know what that, how that would work, and um, is that meant to cut down on the number of people that go in without a, a sticker on their car, or to, to um, monitor them? Um, <laughs> well, the beauty I've of, heard of I've heard about people saying that there are people, you know, nobody ever really checks the sticker. Like, there's lots of people that go into our transfer station and dump that don't even live in town and things like that. So, is that what that's for? Well, um, so if we do pay as you throw, as I've outlined right. it, um, the, the color bags would be uh, an enforcement mechanism in and of themselves. You don't really have to worry about if people have a dumb sticker or not, because if they're willing to pay, go to Ferns, buy bags, and then throw stuff away, okay, we'll let them. You know, it's not that big a deal. Hmm. Um, well, that, that, that's the least mm -hmm. of our problems. I'm not, I'm not sure that that, yeah. right. I mean, well, those, 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 those. Given that other communities are doing the same thing, and uh, you know, I we're think not you still want to make sure they have that they're a Carlisle resident, right? Right. But what I'm saying is, right now, because we're a small town and we don't have a high staffing level, I don't think we have very good compliance with dump stickers. I did a little study and discovered um, four out of 31 or five out of 31 vehicles didn't have dump stickers. One of which wasn't even registered in Carlisle. So, um, but. You know, we could say, well, let's use a transponder system and, you know, really automate this. But then you're solving this small aspect of things that um, will automatically get taken care of for the most part. With Right. Uh, I, I just want to be clear because I'm very against saying that people without a dump sticker should come in because all you're talking about is the garbage that's going into the compactor. You, we're, you're not talking about the recycling. You're not talking about what's true, going into true. the swap shed. You're not talking about the metal waste. The, you, you still need to make sure it's a Carlisle resident and, the, and that yeah. Carlisle, you know, because it's Carlisle taxes that are dealing with those things. Um, so, uh, you know, I, th I think right. it's still they still need to make sure that there's a dust right. sticker. I, I'm, I'm saying that right now we, we are an island in a sea of communities that restrict trash. Even the curbside recycling is all restricted. You only, and you have to pay extra if you go beyond the particular container that you have for a household. So we're the only place anywhere around where you, it's a all you can eat buffet where you have an unlimited doggy bag that you can take with you. And everybody else is, has clamped down on things. So there's a huge motivation 
I would argue, for people to come to Carlisle. If we implement pay-as-you-throw, that motivation pretty much mm -hmm. completely disappears. Okay. All right, thank you. So I'm going to... Uh, the last, just one last tip. That peanut butter in the jar thing, if you have a dog, just give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, and it keeps them happy. Unfortunately, right, my so dog died. Stop this discussion. I'm going to invite you back. Yep. So I'm going to say that um, our, our report is on, our, uh, on the town website. On, on, the, uh, on the recycling committee page, um, if people want to see the actual report. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. So, Tim, let's uh, pick another time when they can come back, maybe okay. the 29th? 26th? 26th. Uh, February 26th. 20 yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the 29th. Not the next one, the one after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other 29th. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It's also yeah. almost single stream. That's the other thing they didn't really um, emphasize. Right now we're doing plastic. And, uh, yeah, so another biggie. Okay. Is the Deer Committee here? Uh, I saw Dan. Uh, is that it? Dan Bojanic's in the back row. Okay. Did it? He said yeah. they'd be here. I don't know who. Oh, this here's Dan right now. Okay. Um, excuse me. Oh no. Excuse me, everybody. We're going to move on to the next topic. So if you could please leave or stop talking. Take your conversations outside. Thank you. <laughs> okay, our next Nancy um, starts with a K. I know what it is. <laughs> this is terrible. Okay, so the next item is uh, the Deer Committee um, is providing a report to the selectmen. Is the Deer Committee here? Okay. Uh, you can come right on up here and sit down. No, they're here. They're here. They're, here. they're, they're walking up. Eight fifty. So if you wouldn't mind just saying your name and, and Carrie, you're on the committee too, right? Yes. Okay, so we'll just introduce yourselves and, and we'll jump into it. So I'm Steve Tobin, representing the Trails Committee. I'm John Keating, member at large. Uh, Dan Boyanich, the deer agent. And Carrie. All right. Carrie's <coughs> <coughs> waving. We'll just chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do you want to go ahead and go through the uh, the hunting report for us? Um, so what so what we've got here is a, a five page document. How would you like us? Do you want us to quickly just sort of summarize through yeah, the various summarize through it? Yeah, the, the important the, the, the parts that you think are most important. You want to okay. make sure that you point out to us. Okay. So uh, maybe maybe to start off with, just uh, read the executive summary in its in its entirety, because I think that sets the scene for the rest of the document. So um, it says here, the Carlisle deer hunting pilot ran from October the first through to November the twenty fourth. Eighteen hunters hunted on town land, and ten deer were harvested, which is considered a success. There were zero safety incidents. Significant learning was gleaned which will be used to further improve the program should it continue. Uh, so what we've got in the rest of the document, uh, we start off with a, a basic introduction and background. I think many of you have actually heard a lot of this from previous uh, meetings. Um, what, it, what it does outline is that uh, this was a bow hunting program. Um, the deer committee has been operating for about 18 months or so, putting together regulations, putting in, 
putting into effect processes, hunter interviews and so on, and, and then executing on the hunt. Um, we go into um, various uh, details about how hunting is performed, uh, the location, uh, the height of the tree stands, um, the actual regulations imposed by the state which effectively uh, limit the location of the uh, hunters relative to houses and roads. And uh, what we then um, describe is how we selected the dates based upon um, the state um, mandated dates plus the feedback we had from town residents. So in summary, we hunted a short season, which was October the 1st uh, through to uh, November the 24th. As far as the uh, hunting parcels were concerned, we selected five uh, parcels in total. Um, that represented about 270 out of a total of 1,100 acres of town-owned land. So we, uh, we actually only enabled about 25% of town-owned land to be hunted, and that was shared by 18 hunters. Uh, so the five parcels in question were Benfield, Conantland, the Davis Corridor, uh, Greeno, and the Town Forest. So um, we have got in the document uh, links to various maps and so on, so you can actually drill down to quite a lot of information. And right at the end of the document, we've got frequently asked questions and various other references as well. Uh, so there's a lot of information in this. As far as the uh, hunters were concerned, um, we went through uh, various selection procedures to select 18 hunters, all had bow hunter education certificates. There were seven residents and 11 non-residents. As far as the deer harvest uh, was concerned, a total of 10 deer were taken, five bucks and five does. One in the town forest, one in Benfield, and eight in the Davis Corridor. Um, I actually just got the figures today, but in Carlisle, the total figure was 49 for the whole town. Okay, so we contributed 10 out of the 49, and it's the highest figure that Carlisle has ever achieved in the records that we've got. The previous high being 41. Okay, so I think we made a, a significant contribution towards the total uh, deer harvest. Uh, as far as uh, comparative data is concerned, we uh, looked at Dover. We actually had some figures from them. And when you consider the total number of hunters in Dover compared to the deer taken, we were very, very favorable. Um, we had 18 hunters and 10 deer were taken. For the figures in Dover for 2010, they had 31 hunters with 19 deer taken. And in 2012, there were 58 hunters and 29 deer taken. So like I say, very comparable statistics. Interestingly enough, we actually had a short season. So we only hunted until the 24th of November. Legal hunting was allowed until the 31st of December. So the Dover figures represent a full season's worth of hunting. Okay, uh, so that's basically the summary of, uh, of uh, the deer harvest. And then uh, what we uh, have done in the report is we've basically collated information that we've gleaned uh, both from personal observations uh, as well as feedback from members of the community and, and so on. So what we're covering uh, in the latter part of the document is basically items such as, in, no, in no specific order, these were just basically uh, a, cat a catalogued list. We covered uh, learnings from the signage. Uh, we catalogued uh, two incidents that happened. Uh, we uh, catalogued uh, observations such as people mentioning that they saw litter, uh, some feedback on tree stand orientation, uh, one incident of hunter harassment, um, feedback from trail users, uh, the observation that there was uh, one illegal tree stand found, not on the five parcels, but we, we took it upon ourselves to actually address that issue as well. Um, there was uh, feedback uh, from members of the public with respect to the timing of tree stand removal. And finally, um, some feedback and concerns about trail cameras. So we've covered all of these items. Uh, hopefully you've read uh, the report. And uh, obviously we're here to answer any questions that you may have. 
Okay, um, I, I just had a uh, bunch of questions. Surprise, surprise. But um, on uh, the bottom, I think, of the first page, um, <coughs> yep, um, on the bottom of the first page, uh, it says, um, incidentally, throughout this period, neither hunters nor members of the public were requested or required to wear orange clothing, which is mandatory for hunters and recommended for the public from November 26th when the gun season started. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Okay. So uh, when, um, uh, during the period of bow season, uh, hunters are not required to wear any form of uh, orange clothing. They wear full camouflage. Uh, but no orange, and that is because archery is considered, bow hunting is considered a very safe activity, and as a result, the hunters themselves can be in full concealment. And uh, okay. It's also a It's it's also not recommended for the public to have to wear orange because again, it's considered a very safe activity. When we move to the use of shotguns and muzzle loaders, which are true firearms then it's considered much safer for people to wear orange. It's mandatory for hunters to do that. They legally have to wear orange. And it's also recommended for the public to wear orange as well. It's just a matter of common sense. Okay, it just the, the way it was written, I, it looked like it was saying that uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't have them do it, but it's actually <laughs> mandatory that they did it. Yeah, no, and so that it just seems it's mandatory for gun season. It's not mandatory yeah, it after yeah, yeah. November the 26th. Yeah, right. yeah. It, it, so it was just, it, that just wasn't yeah. clear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we were just basically trying to clarify um, the, the issue that, or, you know, people were asking why uh, weren't members of the public being asked to wear orange and why weren't the hunters mm -hmm. wearing orange and we were saying it wasn't necessary. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I, I guess, uh, you know, some other things that, that I would say is, you know, if the town does vote to uh well we're going to talk about what the, the vote would be um but i think i think that you know if this does go on in in future years it's really important that the the committee really does address the signage issue um just make sure that it's very clear um you know it's uh, it, it's silly to have signage be an issue right because it's something that could so easily be fixed um and so i think we really would need to make sure that that was uh, that was addressed um, and uh, the, um, so the incidents um, so on uh, section two for the incidents um, it says there that uh, that uh, you're considering a, a penalty for infringement upon the rules yeah I mean what we what we basically are, are using the we, you know this is a pilot year uh -huh. so we're using this as a, a learning experience to see what measures do we need to put into place mm -hmm. uh, the one learning obviously we we've, we've got is that we never actually articulated what penalties would be for infringement and so that's something the deer committee still has to finalize but the suggestion has been to actually make it very explicit in any documentation such as applications so that there is no ambiguity whatsoever so if there is an infringement the hunter themselves have actually signed something saying that they understand the penalty for a single infringement will be mm -hmm. okay yeah i think yeah. i think that that's important and yeah. i just highlighted it as something that would yeah. would be important um and uh I, I think the another thing that you know just just this is just looking through the issues and i know that you're on it but um mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, the tree stand issue, I think, is something we'd really want to just make sure that we're addressing. I mean, if, if it's uh, if it's one of the hunters that got a permit through this committee, I think I think that's an infringement, right? It gets back to what is the infringement um, if if it's oriented wrong, um, and uh, uh, you know. So I think that's just something that we need to make sure that we're looking at. I mean, well, what we've obviously discussed is um, there was nothing in the regulations with respect to the tree stand pointing towards the trail. The instructions were not to shoot in the direction of the trail. And uh, when a hunter is actually on their tree stand, they've actually got quite a lot of degrees of freedom of movement. So they could mm -hmm. shoot to the left or shoot to the right. So I think making it a bit more explicit yeah. uh, would be an easy thing to do. Right. But it's going to be very difficult um, in terms of 
direction because they can actually shoot 300 out of the 360 degrees. So if they turn, they could theoretically they could point towards a trail. But I think the important right, thing here I mean, is for them not to shoot at the trail. It, it's important for them not to shoot at the trail, and also right. if it, they certainly could shoot in any direction, but the tree itself should be not, you know, the stand itself should not be on the trail side of the tree. It should yeah. be on, yeah. And we can, we can implement that as a uh, requirement. Um, and uh, so the other thing that came up was uh, the cameras. Are there any thoughts about? That's a, that's a difficult one. I mean, we've got obviously divided opinions from within the committee itself. Um, cameras are pretty important to have. Mm -hmm. And as far as the state is concerned, they see that as a non-issue. I mean, no, no town, no entity has a ban on the use of cameras. And, you know, they are, they're, they're very important in order to be able to pattern deer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, from a personal point of view, I see it as a non-issue, but obviously other people feel yeah, more so strongly about it. So yeah. it's a question. If, if we did implement a ban on cameras, we'd be the only town in Massachusetts doing it. And I think... Yeah, well, I'm not sure that it's necessarily we'll a ban, but, you know, that, yeah. deer, deer can't read. Could we put a sign up on the tree, you know, saying, hey, there's a camera here? Um, just somehow notify that, that there's a camera. You know, where, where, what, you or, know, or limit where the cameras are. I mean, within certain number of feet of the trail, for instance, since they're going to be, they're not really, those cameras, I take it, are not on the trails because that's not who they're interested in looking at. They're interested in off the trail. So I'm assuming those cameras are not looking at the trails. But mm -hmm. um, anyway, I think that's something that we would need need to address a little bit more. So, so I, th I think that's a, that's a good point. I mean, the cameras are in the shooting area. They're off trail. They're very close to the um, tree stands. So we could be more explicit in saying, you know, let's keep them within so many feet of the tree within stand. Within that sort of zone and just, you know, make it clear that, you know, cameras shouldn't be around. The only issue, of course, is that before the season starts, the hunters actually use the cameras to try and determine where to, where put, to put the tree, the tree stands. Stand. Yeah. Um, but most, well, I don't know of any hunters who had actually put a camera on the trail anyway. They would usually try and find game trails and sort of, you know, embedded areas um, where to put their tree stands. So that's something, again, you know, okay. we can discuss. To how to handle that. <coughs> all right, those are all my questions on the report. Do you have any questions? No, I think you covered everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually, just one quick question. It was something you brought up today. So, <clears throat> obviously, the 10 that were, um, you know, the town land ones, right? We know where those actually were. It, it, the other 39, I mean, I'm assuming it's all private property, right? Does somebody actually have to report where? You know, so for example, like if you got this person with the illegal tree stand, right? I mean, they, when I was on Conscom, they were they were finding them not all the time, but every year we'd find one or two. Yeah. Um, do you, when people kill a deer, do they actually have to report where the actual location where they kill it? Only or? the town. Oh, okay, just only the town. Yeah. Oh, all right, okay. That's too bad because it would be interesting. Well, data. I, I mean, from a lot of perspectives, yeah. a monitoring perspective, but also too, you know, I mean. Uh, the you know illegal hunting has been going on in town forever you know it, it, uh, yeah actually uh, of those other ones that were killed were they bow killed or rifle yeah, killed that or? would be the total for all three for uh, all three so uh, some of those would have, might have been shot at uh, yeah. mm -hmm. do we know how many of each no um uh the what the figures that I saw today were that 14,000 deer were killed in Massachusetts uh, last year. Uh, there is a breakdown of does versus bucks and so on. There will be a, a breakdown by zone at some point. I haven't seen those figures, but getting the details like Carlisle, you have to go to Mass Wildlife Direct and, mm -hmm. and, and get those figures. And they were kind to send us because I've been in touch with them. So they've sent us those figures, but those aren't really publicly available as such. Okay. Um, so, Tim, I have a question for you. Uh, Carrie, did you have anything that you wanted to say? I keep forgetting you're on the computer over there. Well, no, only that I, I think the committee has done an absolutely terrific job of implementing this pilot. And uh, it's unfortunate that we have some folks in town that don't be, hesitate to cry fire in a crowded theater and uh, make uh, a lot of other folks who would normally enjoy the trails and be able to enjoy the trails in town wary of doing so and it's a very unfortunate 
aspect of, of this pilot program and this whole thing. A handful of people have basically created uh, more angst than is absolutely, you know, that is warranted by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. Tim, I have a uh, quick question for you. I was looking for it earlier. Um, which which regulation is it that um, uh, permits the uh, Board of Selectmen to uh, allow um, hunting on town on land? It, it, it's in the bylaw, but I think. It's Article 10. Article 10? Do we have, do we have that here? Yeah, it's, more it's like Article 10.1 or something. It's not like zoning. That. It's a general bylaw? It's in the general bylaws, yeah. Firearms and explosives. Yeah. I didn't look there. Okay, yeah, so Article 10, 1.1 1 .1, uh, states that no person shall hunt, fire, or discharge any firearms or explosives of any kind within the limits of any highway, park, or other public property except with the written permission of the Board of Selectmen or such other town officer or officers as they may designate from time to time. Um, so, uh, okay, I just wanted to remind me because I know that we had seen this before. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. but that's again firearm. It doesn't say anything yeah. about... It says hunt. Yeah, hunt is in It says hunt, okay. Yes. Okay, um, okay so... Um, however, you know, so I, th I think it's clear that the Board of Selectmen, by bylaw, we have the right to allow hunting on public property, um, and it is within our authority um, to do so. Um, and, uh, you know, but I think that what we're talking about here is uh, asking the town, because we had asked the town before uh, to look into it, um, whether or not we should look into it. Um, and so what we're talking about here is going back to the town and saying, hey, what do you think? I mean, I, you know, in, in wording it, um, this is just my opinion that I'm opening up to the Board of Selectmen here to talk about. I think what we're asking the town is not that we're taking away our right to do it. We're just getting a sense from the town, is it okay? You know, not is it okay, but um, as a follow-up from the previous one, mm -hmm. we decided that, you know, we want to do this because um, we can't do anything that's kind of counter to the bylaw, right? Um, so in some ha some way we would be wording the warrant article uh, to, you know, I don't know if is it a non-binding thing, a non-binding warrant article? I'm looking to you, Tim. It could, for well, it, it, it could be in the form of, a, uh, as you say, non-binding resolution. It, it, you, you could put another referendum question forward. Is the original the deer hunting question was a, was a ballot question. It wasn't a town. People often say it went to town meeting before. It didn't go to town meeting. It was a ballot question. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one way to do it. Uh, council uh, will do you know, what the board instructs, but the, you know, the, he mentioned there might be a way to uh, make the bylaw more explicit uh, that you know, the board does have the authority to. Uh, well, and it's still, even if, it's pretty even explicit. If we, even if we have well, the authority, if, if the town were to come out vociferously against it, <coughs> we might decide that's not a good thing to do then. Right. You know, even though we I, have the authority absolutely. to do it, I just, we just I, say it's, not, it's, it's something we shouldn't do. Absolutely. I just want to make sure in whatever we're doing in an article or a, a ballot or whatever, a referendum isn't counter to what's in the bylaw. You know, I don't want to create a conflict. I understand. Yep. Um, uh, so I, I guess the first question is, you know, I think, I think you know, if the town were to vote and say, yeah, we should do it, and then the t Board of Selectmen were to then say, yes, you know, we do want to continue doing it, I think that there's some work on the Deer Committee to address a lot of the issues that, yes. that came up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's a part of what we're asking the town. We're not going to be asking the town implementation details. We would just be asking the town, may, you know, in, in some way we're asking them yay or nay, mm -hmm. right? Um, in a way that's not counter to the right. bylaw. Right, I agree. And so you talked to town council and they were saying that that might be either redoing the bylaw, which is a lot of work. The bylaw or an, ar or an article that would be more of a resolution. Again, it, you know, they, they 
town meeting can't bind the selectmen to a course of action that's counter to the bylaws. No. Or, or to, to the ballot question uh, route again, because that that's where, where the original uh, you know, vote was taken. Again, a non-binding ballot question. That's, I don't think there's any way that the, that's the problem with non-binding. Action. Anything non-binding, mm -hmm. it's because I think it's ambiguous. And then even if you know votes, people vote one way, and then you do, they forget. Um, I I think whatever we do, I, I would rather we did it in a binding, clear way. And I don't know what that is necessarily, but yeah. I don't like non-binding. I, I think the I only like so I think we're, we're you know, like the other one, we're either asking for a direction. Um, it seems to me, or we're going to have to um, actually let me let me just do this and take a step back uh, uh, what's the sense of the board as far as us asking town meeting yay or nay on hunting on public properties and whether or not we should where 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 we have the jurisdiction whether or not you know, obviously we can't say you can't hunt on private property and that's not what we're asking we're specifically asking about this pilot program should we continue the pilot program is what's the sense of going to town meeting versus just continuing it as a board selection? It would give us a sense of the democratic purpose of the town meeting, which is to express the will of the town. And if the town comes out overwhelmingly and says, no, we don't want hunting in this town under any circumstances, no bow hunting on town property, then as a selectman, I would take that very very seriously okay uh, yeah I agree I mean either town meeting or a ballot yeah I mean question. I don't care you yeah, know, what, I, what what forum it is I don't care yeah, but right I mean, I mean there has <clears> been <throat> concerns expressed uh, and I see no harm in asking mm. okay okay I, well I think we should ask too I mean but what I, I think I'm still a little confused as what the question is so is the question you know it's the presentation we have this bylaw under this bylaw, we have authorized a pilot, and the question is, do you want us to continue? Is it that we, do you want us to change the bylaw, or do you want us to continue the pilot? I and mean, what, what is the question after that? Well, I think, that's, that, what I'm I think that that's a good question. I think it's something that we need to work out. Okay. My, my, my gut instinct would be, it would be, we did the pilot, these are the results. Do you want us to continue this? Okay, I so think, do you want us that's to the, continue? All right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's my that's my gut reaction yeah. as to what it would be. I mean, we have the right to say put set the speed limit in the, around the rotary at seventy five miles an hour. The town would not like that. We would not Some do it. Some people would. <laughs> well, Some people would. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I, and this, I think this falls into that same category. It's, it's not. His <laughs> <laughs> Prius can really go. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I, I guess what uh, I, I, you know, I, I think the next step would be, you know, for us to sit down and chat with town council more about mm -hmm. and and kind of draft up for our next meeting one you know yep. uh, more wording. detail as to like what this might really be and then get input on what that yeah. I, you know and there is an element in town which feels that there has not the democratic process hasn't been followed um, this hopefully you know if we ask this question which I I don't know how much more clearly we can ask it um, hopefully would give them the forum to argo argue their side of the, you know, mm -hmm. of the question. And there would be a, then a town bait, and I would, well, town council will tell us, but I think I would prefer it not to be a ballot question. I would like to have it voted by people who are, have been to the meeting and have heard the discussion, not by somebody who's kind of, you know, just doesn't know what the question really is and they don't know really how to vote. and. I think uh, we can talk to council, council and, and yes. Wayne. Um, what if we said we had a successful pilot hunt program in the fall and would like you uh, to tell us whether or not to continue uh, uh, doing so? Yes or no? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, right. I, I think I think we're going to want to present, you know, something more. more, you know, both sides. I think maybe or, uh, you know, I don't know. I think I think that um, I don't know that we're going to solve it here tonight. No. Right. Um, so w what I would what I ask it what I what I would ask is that you know the, the selectmen will allow me to work with Tim on on coming up with a, a direction and we chat about it in yeah. two meetings from now. That's, okay. that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Is there any um, comments here? I'm gonna I'm gonna limit them though because we are late. But um, please come on up. Maybe I'll do sure. just a couple. Uh, can brief, okay. please. A couple of things. Uh, uh, we're gonna need to give her a mic. One is that any question that's out there. Wait one second. Wait. We need to give you a mic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Uh, one of the things that uh, any question that is generated and put forth cannot come with a bias, meaning this is what happened in the deer hunt, and it shouldn't be labeled as successful or unsuccessful. It's up to the people to get all the information, to get the report, and then to make their decision there. It's sort of like telling a little kid, you like chocolate ice cream, don't you? And then kid says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah, I, think it, I, just, I think I just stated that. Yeah, so we, we, can't, we can't put a bias in. Uh, another thing is someone said from the do committee that uh, no, no, the state doesn't have a problem with cameras, but the state does have a problem with hunting in, in, in state parks. So if you're hunting in a state park, you, you're doing it illegally. So you do, the fact that there's a camera there or not, the state maybe doesn't, doesn't have a position, but you wouldn't have a camera to hunt in a state park because hunting isn't allowed. Could I just uh, correct you on that? Actually, a lot of state parks in Massachusetts allow hunting. The further west you go, it's uh, almost 100%. So, uh, Great this Great Books, Great Book, this Great Great Book? Book does not allow it, but if you go further out, they okay, because I was under the impression so they it's, didn't. It's, it's nothing to do per se in terms of a, a state edict okay, or so all state land. Okay. Uh, let me ask uh, another question. Um, I disagree with one of these selectmen who said that a group of small group of people have caused unneeded angst. I think that is not a comment that's befitting of a board of a selectman person because they can't feel for somebody else and they can't feel for the town as a whole. So I, I take issue with that question. Um, th uh, one of the other things is we heard earlier today that the, uh, from Sylvia Willard that, it, uh, that Mary, the assistant, has spent at least 60 hours uncompensated since uh, mid-July working on the Deer Committee program. If she had been compensated, that would be an impact on the budget. And that should be brought out because that's going to continue to happen. Another thing is there was no criteria for success. So when you look at success, you have to have a criteria to base it on. When you say, we consider it a success, success, that's not a criteria. And the other question is, does it really accomplish? If it turns out that deer hunting does not accomplish what the, or a deduction in the deer population, and it hasn't because the deer population in the state keeps going up in, in spite of the fact that the number of deer killed keeps going up. So if it doesn't accomplish that, pur that purpose, should we ask ourselves, is this really the path well, so to wait? I'm going to interrupt you for one second. What we're talking about tonight is whether or not this should be a ballot question or not. So if you could just keep your, your comments to oh, okay. whether I or not we, the, you know, the Board of Selectmen should either a ballot or you know, bring it to town meeting. Not, not, I don't want to hear any more comments about whether or not that we should allow hunting or not. You know, it, it, it's just, it's late. Yeah. You, you got up and you spoke at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah. Um, I want to just keep it focused on our uh, discussion right now is should we bring it to town meeting or not? Okay, I, I'm sorry because the, the item issue just said pilot program. It didn't right. mention it as it a now. war in action. Okay, no, I, have, yeah. I, okay. I, I agree with that. So anyway, those are my points. And I think that it should come up as a warrant article. And I think uh, I still say that I am, in, I am putting a... I would like to put an article into it about deer hunting because we don't know what the Board of Selectmen uh, warrant article is going to be, so I'm putting a placeholder. Well, you will in. in two meetings. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know about process about that and how articles, citizen articles, actually get 
uh, push, but don't they have to have a certain number of yeah, signatures yeah, have and they have to be... Yeah, there's, 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 there's a process, I think you can talk ten, to counsel. I just found yeah. out, yes, it's 10 signatures of voters that can be verified that they live at the address. And so you well. would draft something, and I think that would actually be rather helpful if you would do that. Draft what you think looks like a good art that you would like to see as a warrant article yeah. and bring it to Tim. And if that, you know, maybe that's our article. I don't know. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, but I'm sorry about that. I didn't know you were limiting to me. Um, well, we're our, trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Question. Ed Ed Hum uh, nine seven. I'm sorry. Ed Hum uh, East Street. When Dan when Dan explained the way they were going to hunt, he stated that all of the stands would face away from the trail. No one would be uh, facing the trails. It turned out that two of the fans uh, stands were facing the trail and it was very much uh, discussed and he made light of the fact that you can really swing around and you really could shoot effectively uh, toward even the direction of the trail and I find that very disturbing because he made time after time he stated that that they would all face with their back towards the towards the trail uh, the other thing is that Dan is a deer agent I felt he should know where every stand was and have checked it out but as a matter of fact he took a, a trip to through the uh, hunting area and he was only able to find a couple of stands I, I think if you're going, if you were going to continue, that the deer agents should be interested in making sure that the hunters are following the rules, and I don't think that was done. Is that it? All right. Um, all right. The last one. This, this, I'll try to make it really quick. Um, at the beginning of this meeting, some, someone asked um, about the public meeting, um, the public forum f to discuss the deer hunt. And um, it seemed like the response was that this is the public meeting, that, it's, that tonight is that public meeting. A am I correct? No. Uh, uh, what I said was this was the selectmen's public meeting uh, talking about whether or not it was going to go to town meeting or not. Okay, good. Is, so, is there going to be I a think public that the meeting? The committee had a posted meeting. Is that right? There's been, been no posted there meeting. There was that meeting on yeah, in the beginning of January. Yeah. Excuse me. Sure. There was because you, when we talked about this, um, did you or did you not? You you had a post posted public meeting. Yes. And what what was the date? And are there minutes for that meeting? And was anybody that's in the audience now at that meeting? January 3rd, yes. Well, uh, to quote something that you said right, sitting right there, you said, we will make sure that it is well advertised when this meeting is happening, and then they can come back to the Board of Selectmen, et cetera, et cetera. There's been no well advertised public meeting. Did, were you aware of the meeting? Did you go to the meeting? I've been to deer committee meetings, but I haven't been to a public meeting for, um, to, 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 let the, uh, I thought that this was to get information from, I mean, you know how we feel. I thought this was to gather information from more than just us. Uh, so all, all of our meetings are public meetings, and that's what I meant by a public meeting. Um, so what, what were you thinking, you, you were thinking that it was going to be like a... Well, according to Kerry, he said that the, a public forum is a very different kind of meeting from a selectman's meeting, and that a selectman's meeting is to, uh, is a meeting for the selectman to do the business of the town as opposed to a public hearing, which is a very different kind of meeting. And the right. So it, it wouldn't be a public hearing, which is true. That is a very different kind of meeting. Um, and that's kind of an official type of public meeting that you do for particular things. Um, but uh, so 
if this is going to town meeting, is that not a public meeting? Well, what you said was that we would have this, here we go. Uh, and so it seems to me we have that form and there is yet another form after that, which would be town meeting. That's what you said. Uh -huh. So I just- Oh, I'm missing something. So they, they had their meeting, which was a public meeting. We've just had this meeting, which I think that we reached out to some of you, right, Tim? Mm -hmm. yeah. To make sure that you just, I just wanted to make sure you knew that we were talking about this. So I asked him to reach out and make, to make sure that you could come and then we would have a town meeting. That's, so, that's so three public meetings, plus all of the meetings that we've been getting public input at the beginning of every meeting. Um, uh, l let me finish up here first. Well, it's, when I first stood here, I read that letter from Judy Asserkoff asking, um, I believe strongly that an open discussion meeting be held soon to hear from folks in town. And that's when you responded that we would have that meeting, that not a committee meeting, but a, a public forum. Uh, and now it seems as though you're going back on that. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't feel like that I am because the, the, the Deer Committee put together, they, they had a meeting, and they got public input. Is this right? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. That's I wasn't there. Say, yeah. I, was, I wasn't there. And uh, so you had the meeting, you got public input, you created the report, and then you presented it to us. Did, am, I, am, I, am I right in that? Well, let, let, me, let me clarify how, how things work. So the deer, commit, the deer committee put together the deer hunting report, which is what you have um, read, and that was uh, based upon public input from several sessions before um, January the second, January the third. Uh, January the second, January third. I can't remember the date. Third was it? Okay. We actually had a dear committee meeting, and on the agenda was public input, and members of the public were given the opportunity to say whatever they had to say, and the draft minutes have been written. I haven't actually, um, I, I can't remember whether I've uh, seen them yet, but basically the draft minutes haven't been approved by the committee yet. So there is that um, document that's still going to be issued. But I think the understanding from the dear committee was that that would be the collated input from, from the public and that it would be all documented as far as the minutes were concerned and that those would be circulated once they've been approved. And did you have somebody there from the public at, at, who attended that meeting? Uh, you, you were there. Everyone In fact, I think most people who are here tonight were there. So. The, all I would say is that you already know how we feel. You didn't get anybody else's opinion and it would be good, I think. I really wish you would honor what you said and, and actually have a public meeting where you actually advertise it in the Mosquito and let people come and, and, and express their opinion and not have it at, you know, after 10 o'clock at night. I think that would be the di the di a good thing. Just, just clarification, the Dear Committee meeting was advertised in the Mosquito and the agenda was published on the town's, on the town's website. So I'm not sure what more we could have done in terms of at least giving people the opportunity to come to the meeting. So this is, this is the process that, that I was stating and that I thought that I was agreeing to. So we had had a discussion <coughs> while the hunt was in process. Um, I think we actually had a couple of discussions <coughs> while the hunt w was in process because there was a request to stop the hunt. And we decided, no, we're not gonna stop the hunt. Um, and there was a question about, well, what is the next step? And I said, there will be a public meeting and that's the public meeting that you had where you're gathering the input in order to create your report. Um, you had that meeting. Um, you provided your report. We're having this meeting. Both of them were published in the Mosquito. Um, we reached out to you to make sure that you knew that this particular meeting was happening. Um, so what your, what, what your request is, is that we have a separate meeting that is published that that is who's leading that meeting so is it is it the 
the deer committee and the board of selectmen are saying we're going to have another meeting to talk about this or uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the difference is in the meeting. Then we're we're posting this. This is how we post what our agenda is. People come. Uh, we reach out to those people that we know are interested in providing feedback. Um, I'm not sure what what the how, how the outcome would be different if we just had another meeting that's the same people. I, I guess it's m my fault for imagining that there would be something that there would be um, a larger group of people that would come in and express their opinion. I mean, we've we've read some letters to the editor and some editorials in the paper, so we know that there's more than just the few of us and our opinions. That there are more opinions out there. I just imagined something larger. That's all. Thank okay. you. I'll, I'll think about it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, no, I, I, I think Maple Sir? Street to support the former speaker. We've been waiting for the public meeting. Not to mention names, but uh, <coughs> somebody, uh, uh, she mentioned names. We were assured that we would have input to the Deer Committee's final report. And we were told that the BOS is not that public meeting. Very, very emphatically, if I have to use names, Kerry said it, and you said it. So we're waiting for this momentous Deer Committee meeting that was flagged as a public meeting, not just an announcement the Deer Committee will meet on January 3rd. That was just a routine committee. This was supposed to be announced a, as, as an input as meeting, hearing, and we didn't have it, okay? And, and Kerry, and also our understanding very, very clearly, because we've been talking about it for two months and waiting for this meeting, was not ever going to be the BOS thing. Kerry was emphatic. It has to be a separate, dedicated meeting. It's not the town meeting, which is in the future, and it's not anything to do with the BOS. So, yes, maybe there was a January 3rd meeting, and maybe it was posted, but it wasn't flagged as the public forum meeting. Not that the public are invited in the casual way, as, as always, but this was our forum, or we would have been there. So this is premature to go ahead with anything without that public meeting. All right. Okay, um, thank you all very, very much for coming. You're welcome. Okay, uh, I'm meeting bylaws. Not meaning warrant articles. We can go with that if you want. <laughs> okay, um, so we're moving on. If you could bring your discussion outside. Um, okay. Uh, Kim, do you want to bring us through these? Sure, sure. This is the, uh, the entire list of potential town meeting warrant articles, those that... Uh, our annual and reoccurring, which is the, really the first 18 on the list, are uh, oh, thank you. Our articles you've seen before, the, bud, the budget and uh, things that uh, have to be on the warrant. And then there's a list of, I think it's 22 or 23 uh, new articles, if you will, or, or articles that boards and committees, individuals uh, have suggested uh, uh, be included in the warrant. What, uh, what I've, I've reached out to uh, the proponents of these articles, and I've told them that we'll set up agenda time for each of them to make their pitch, if you will, to the Board of Selectmen as to why uh, their particular request is, uh, is ready uh, uh, to go forward at town meeting and, and provide some justification for the request so that we can uh, separate uh, you know, the, the articles that are ready for prime time from the, the ones that might just be a, a notion at this point or, or not quite fully fleshed out. So we can, uh, if you want to go through the, uh, the first 18, I think. Uh, I don't think we have to go through debate. the first 18. Those are, those are I yeah. think, uh, should be without debate. Uh, we're, those will be on there. Uh, regarding Maybe the we could not do the budget one. That'd be, <laughs> yeah. That could be a, an option this year. So regarding the new uh, warrant article requests, 
Uh, the first two submitted by the town clerk, uh, general bylaw uh, amendments. One is just a, a cleanup article. That there are, in one section of the bylaw, there are two articles that have the same article number, so she proposing to, to fix that. That's the first one. It's, it's a pretty routine uh, uh, cleanup kind of thing. She's also proposing uh, accepting a state statute that allows uh, reduced dog licenses for those uh, over age 70. And I asked her about the reduced fee. It'd actually be a fee waiver. Uh, I think the licenses are 10 now, and so there'd be a fee waiver for uh, available for those over age 70. Did you did you talk with her at all about? Dogs over the age of 70 are they? <laughs> you know what? That's well, exactly years, what I said to Tim. Years when I was on the phone. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, did you? Uh, it's, a, it's a state statute that allows uh, uh, for a fee waiver for now is this uh, so you and I had talked about this over the phone and uh, whether or not it could be made a little bit more generic at the town clerk's uh, discretion rather than just a set 70 I mean uh, it might be uh, an income issue uh, you know uh, you know, like the the number seventy seems just kind of arbitrary. I think right? that, I think that that's language from the state. So it has to statute. it has so to be this. That, uh, I mean, there may be some flexibility that the clerk could apply on her own initiative. But if you accept accept that state statute, it's seventy. It's it's age seventy. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, item three. Uh, you remember the agricultural commission had proposed a right to farm uh, bylaw, uh, and we did have town council review that. Uh, uh, kind of side by side with the noise bylaw that pertains to roosters, and he found that there was no conflict. That the right to farm uh, bylaw is aimed at commercial farming operations, and which is excluded in the noise bylaw. Right, so that, I think so that's that what there's, it is. Okay, there, there's no conflict inherent there. Uh, the next two uh, articles uh, pertain to proposed uh, a solar facility lease uh, for both the transfer station and the. Uh, CPS sites. Uh, the working group has been working with town council on that and uh, will be coming in to talk to the yeah. selectmen about that. Do you know when they'll be in to talk yeah, about could, well, the design? One of, of the, uh, one of the, the, the action items today was to get a, a, a design from a Moresco. That's something we've been lacking. We've seen some kind of bad diagrams that don't tell you too much, would you say, <laughs> Alan? That's yeah, because I think it's still up in... It characterizes it very well. Yeah. It's still up in the air as to <laughs> which, where, where it's going and how it's being installed, right? Right. Because we, we, like. we did not agree, you know, alongside the road. Yeah. We did not agree as a canopy. We haven't agreed to anything right. yet. Right. right. There are there trees and, yeah. two walkthroughs tomorrow with them. Okay. With Amorasco. One at the school and one at the transfer station. Okay. We're trying to we're trying to move them along on the design criteria. Okay. And then all right. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the next one, uh, the uh, CCRSD has a capital request for two million dollars for uh, repaving a roadway and additional parking at the high school. Uh, uh, talk to the superintendent. They they're planning on coming in to one of the February meetings to make that uh, presentation on that capital. Uh, on What's our capital. percentage of that two million? About about a quarter, about twenty five percent of that. Um, yeah, and they, and it's not clear at the end of the day whether it's going to stay as one or be broken up as the two. There, there um, seems to be more support from the finance committee and others for the road reconstruction paving project, more so than the additional parking to accommodate, I guess, high school juniors. And at this point, it's all one package, so it'll either go up or down. But they'll, <laughs> they'll explain <laughs> that. All right, let's move uh, on. Item seven will be, uh, we're holding a place for uh, something for uh, continuation of deer hunting, whether that's, uh, uh, as council says, a bylaw or a resolution, or, or if uh, the board decided on a ballot question, it wouldn't be on their warrant at all, but it would be on the, on the election warrant. That remains to be seen how that will be be fleshed out. Uh, planning board has requested master plan funding for $160,000. Do we know when they're going to plan on coming and talking to us? Uh, I, I, we haven't scheduled them yet. All the, all of the proponents have been told to plan on one of the, one of the two February meetings, so we're going to okay. schedule that for the next couple of agendas. Uh, then there is a supplemental funding for complete streets 
crosswalk safety projects for $50,000. The Complete Streets grant funded three of the town's four uh, safety uh, projects. And this, this specific request would be for the one that was not funded by Complete Streets. It would be, uh, I don't know if it's project three or four, but the one that wasn't funded uh, would require additional funding. And they're, they're planning on uh, coming on the 12th. So we'll talk about that. And um, do we know when we're going to start seeing some plans? And well, I guess we have to put together that committee first, right? Put the, the committee together and uh, gathering quotes from uh, engineering firms on the des the design. <coughs> you recall was estimated at about forty-five or fifty thousand uh, dollars. And Gary Davis is uh, okay with using the additional Chapter Ninety we got uh, in this fiscal year, which was coincidentally about fifty thousand dollars to uh I, did, I just i'm not i'm not exactly sure why we would ask the town for fifty thousand dollars in a year when we have already have a really big project that we need to manage um you know, it seems like why not why not manage that project and manage it to success because it has to be done by next june right um, and then see how it goes and then maybe go back to town and ask for for more funding yeah i think yeah um, that's that's just my own to personal pick, opinion. Pick up the piece that was left out. They yeah, want, but, they want but we have a huge project we need to do, right? No, I, yeah, but I, if I, it's I, in between the couple of other pieces and it doesn't make it a complete project, yeah, then, yeah. so it, I don't. I, I, I think, think that's, that's why we need more information. Yeah, ultimately, yeah. Really, this is what you know. Yeah. This is this. No, this is the other three this not work because this doesn't get done. Right. Or, no, this or, isn't. This is the one that <laughs> the raised crosswalk. The raised crosswalk that wasn't even in the package, right? Um. This is the one that they. This is the fifty thousand that they asked for because no matter what was given to us, this wasn't going to happen. Okay. Well, it wasn't. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that there's some Eligible. other fourth part that's not a part of it that mm. we're not being asked to fund. We need, but yeah, what yeah, we have to yeah, find yeah, out. You see it. Yeah. yeah. Because this, we were asked for this fifty thousand no matter what. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, and Bob Zog of the Energy Task Force uh, has requested a non-binding resolution on town goals for greenhouse greenhouse gas emissions. So again, it would be. Uh, so this is what? <laughs> would be, well, it, it would here, have to here, be as a non-binding resolution because there's no way you could com town meeting couldn't compel the town to uh, achieve certain goals for yeah. greenhouse this may gas have emissions. Green communities. Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in general, I think I could, you know, state the moderator is not in favor of non-binding questions that he's not in favor of them either. Articles that, that are not effective no matter what vote is passed. That's not sort of the intent of town meeting. Then we have two art zoning articles from the planning board regarding uh, marijuana. Uh, to establish uh, restrictions on siting. And operating recreational marijuana, and, and another one that would propose a partial or total ban on such uses. Uh, and town council has been working with the planning board on those. That we, we should have some language. Uh, Do you shortly. know if it's going to be a partial or a total? Uh, I, I I don't know yet. What, whatever it is, uh, you see the language says that that a ballot question uh, has to be proposed by the board. I, mm -hmm. I was, was that, wondering that, about that. Why is that? I think that. Uh, I think, I think it requires both a town meeting vote and a, and a affirmative ballot vote. If you're going to ban it outright, you've got to, you've got to, the town has to say so, both at town meeting and at the ballot. Uh, so ban the use of rec recreation? No. no. So what, that's what it says. It's the facility. Yeah. It's the right. facility. It's yeah. yeah. improperly written. We okay. Can't, that's we why, can't I, that's why I was, I, that's why I was very confused by this whole yeah. thing. <laughs> being such facilities in town, I think. Uh, the intent. Facilities. Okay. All right. Uh, Financial words. Uh, number 13, uh, 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 there right would there. need to be a, an amendment to the uh, solar overlay district to uh, allow a possible uh, canopy at, at the Carlisle Public School right. property over the parking lot. Requires a zoning amendment. Uh, and another, uh, there are several zoning amendments, all of which uh, I would ask you to r vote to refer to the planning board for public hearings. That's that's the requirement. They need to have public hearings on all of these, and 
the way that it works is the selectmen have to ask them to do so. So at the end of all this, we can't forget to do that. That's uh, number 11 through uh, 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 15. Yeah. Let's see, uh, 15, right? 11 through 15. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, we, did, we didn't get that. Uh, 15 was a proposed, we thought it would be a zoning, uh, rezoning of 21 to 23 Bedford Road. Instead, they submitted the, that nitrogen credit bylaw that they, or easement rather, they didn't present tonight. So that's not really a zoning change. That's a, a proposed. Uh, so it's 11 easement. through 14. Right, 11 through 14. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, well, then 16 is that citizen's petition that uh, uh, Eric Adams was going to present tonight to uh, the Board of Selectmen. The town meeting has to vote 14. to allow the board to grant an easement over town property. Then, actually, we have to go out to bid and uh, do a competitive process uh, because it's an interest in land, and you can't direct a certain interest in land to a certain party without a competitive process so it's kind of a well and is is do you know if he's asking to use the entire property i i, I don't as know as an offset or just a portion of I, it? I think it's a portion but i don't know because okay, that wasn't clear <laughs> what he had i mean yeah that'll have to get flushed yes, out i mean i think it's important for us to know because yeah is this because he wants to put a septic in there he, well, he doesn't want to put the septic in there. He just wants to have that as an offset to the fact that he doesn't have enough land. Yeah. Um, isn't it? Because that's what we were saying that we could do with golf. No, it usually has to do with septic <laughs> in the load. It. It, it's, he was at the planning board last night. Um, I just happened to be there overhearing it. But it's in case they have a failed septic, Basically, right now, they're restricted because they're non-conforming to the septic they have and therefore can't change use, can't change anything, can't do anything. So if, if they want to change the use or if they have a failed septic, then they would need more land than they have. So it would be to have that credit land available in case they needed to do that. But that credit land in order to actually put a septic there? No, it's, it's, it, you don't put anything there. It's just land that can't be used for anything else because you've use that that's what credit land means yeah. it's credited right to their septic maybe i didn't word it right More but that's what i was meaning nothing actually say. goes there yes yeah. but no, the it would is on their property but it would mean that the town would never be able to do anything there right. except a park um or something that did not in any way violate the rules around a credit land yeah. credit land is you know a permanent restriction on on the property Anyway, that's what okay. Talking Thank about. you. I, I can we just go back to fourteen for half a second because I'd like to know. Um, this gets back to. Uh, th this this goes the back ROSC, to David. The, the Woodward property, right? Is that the, right? Yeah, but why would we? Uh, why would the town uh, install and maintain a public water supply? It's in case we ever <coughs> to preserve the. This is just right. This is just to, for the town to have the right, and this should be changed. It should say include piping for piping public water supply facilities. Um, Th so that would be go somewhere else, or well, what? The, the town has reserved water rights on what used to be the O'Rourke land. Right. And so all this does is it would allow for a piping for that to run through the open space that we hope to get from the okay that's the one that we saw the other day yeah, right. that but uh, why would we that say we, that we said was i mean what if in the future there's because, another because it's all because that needs to be um open space and uh -huh. putting a public water supply there would be a change of use mm. that would be a problem so this is just to solve the change of use just for piping because the only public water supply opportunity the town has is on the O'Rourke land where we're not looking yeah. to change that it's just if we ever were to use that we need to be able to get as the water out as possible get it to the road that's all mm -hmm. so this has nothing to do with whether we want to do that or not mm -hmm. it's just to allow it to happen and to put it in the bylaw so we don't have the problem with the CR, the, the reason I, I did I, this okay, was because now when I, that's, was here okay. last time, All right. and I said I think <laughs> we're going to have the problem here, and then afterwards I went back and learned from Steve Hinton and Wayne, 
and I've been working with town council and we have the bylaw and in place and I just okay. I'm, I'm going to review it with the developer and he has to accept <laughs> that it. makes way more sense than what I yeah what but it's important that this should say <laughs> in case to the, to the extent that this is a public document yeah it should say include piping for public water supply facilities so it doesn't sound like we're authorizing the putting of a public what, water that's supply. what it looked like exactly. <laughs> I like, why in the world would I okay. want to do that so 15 we're not doing 16 we need more information mm -hmm. 17 17 is to amend the list of scenic roads the Rockland Road I know is one I think there's also some interest in adding stories we always get requests for scenic roads for dead-end streets <laughs> <laughs> Well, What's with that? and and as the res residents of Rockland Road who want this, because it makes um, it can make I their understand. life um, no well trees um, came over from the planning board. It's on the public right. I know, but it makes the town's mm -hmm. life maybe more difficult if a tree needs to come down for whatever reason. It is okay. Okay, the next uh, general bylaw amendment uh, to change the uh, designation of uh, membership on the CPC from uh, Carlisle Housing Authority to Housing Trust. Currently, it, uh, this was one David uh, had bird dugged for us. <coughs> that, that needs to change if uh, uh, yeah, that authority goes away. Around, right? uh, an article. 19, the Recreation Commission is requesting $20,000 for a, uh, a field study, Spalding Field. And they're... It doesn't have a U in it, by the way. It does, does here. <laughs> <laughs> it does now. It does now. It's a public document. <laughs> Too late to change All it. those baseballs are wrong? Mm. <laughs> That's right. It must have been the... It's not named after the baseball. <laughs> All right, and the facilities committee requested a, a warrant article for possible remediation of contaminated soil due to fuel tank removal at the fire station. And I think the $100,000 was kind of a, a guess on their part, but to have something on the warrant that could provide in case the news is very Turns out bad. To be bad but, but we would we know. don't expect it. We don't we'll expect know it before be March. We would know yeah. whether because or not this was the remediation plan has to be written before in by March anyway. So. Mm -hmm. And the household recycling committee has asked for a resolution regarding whether the town su would support a pay as you throw solid waste program. And uh, also, would tell me vote. Uh, requested to dissolve the Carlisle Housing Authority and transfer its responsibilities to the Carlisle Affordable Housing Trust. I'd like to or whatever form that takes. should eliminate all the words after authority on that. Well, there, there's nothing official about that. No, this I understand, but, I, but again, for, to the degree this is a public document, and since we have a reporter here, it's very important that town meeting has no say in whether the authority yeah. transfers. In fact, that yeah. might already have been done. Well, it's in process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what okay. I mean. By the time we get well, to meet the town meeting, just, that might the already have just been to done. dissolve the housing authority. Yes. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you for that. So is there a motion to send uh, item number 11, the new zoning uh, regarding uh, requirements and restrictions on siting and operating recreational marijuana facilities, uh, number 12, uh, partial or total ban on recreational marijuana uses, uh, item number 13, an amendment of section 5.3 of the solar photovoltaic facilities to expand uh, to the Carlisle School property, and number 14, an amendment to section 5.12 ROSC uh, to expand allowed uses for uh, public water uh, uh, piping uh, installed and maintained by the town to the planning board uh, and 15 uh, zoning uh, I thought that they withdrew this one that was not submitted yeah. that, that we thought that was coming in they, they came in with the citizens petition on the nitrogen instead so, so you can eliminate 15 is there is there a motion there so moved okay Second. all right any further discussion okay uh, seeing none all those in favor Kissing her eye. Read eye. 
of brown eye. Let's go a little bit. Lewis eye. It down. It's, <laughs> it's late when I can't Lewis. think of my last name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Liaison reports. I haven't been to any meetings. It's nice. No, oh. I, I've been to several, uh, <laughs> but I'll keep it short. Uh, the uh, negotiations with Amoresco uh, have been moving slowly, uh, but they're coming tomorrow yeah. for uh, to do a site visit to the school and to the transfer station. I will be there uh, for the transfer station component. Okay. Uh, okay. We we, uh, we are putting the uh, we push down on the accelerator a bit uh, on that process because the longer it takes, uh, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen uh, both before and after town meeting in order to get that accomplished and get stuff moving forward. And, and the longer we wait, the lower down the block we're going to be, and the less the reimbursement will be. Yeah. Okay. Unless the pilot will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've still both been working on the fire department, the fire chief thing. Yeah. We're not going to present anything yeah. there tonight. All right. And the and the police negotiations are going forward. Okay. Yes. Oh, good. good. Well, yes. we had well, one meeting. Yeah, we're going to yeah. yeah. have our first meeting next week. Yeah. Okay. No, tomorrow. 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 <laughs> yeah. um, Luke and I are Zealand. still working on the uh, police chief contract um, based on the feedback that we got. Um, and a, a resetting with uh, the chief. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the teachers, yeah. we're meeting with them on February 26th. 26th. Yeah, better that's put that a big right. day for you. Um, so we're, we're meeting with them uh, to continue those negotiations. Um, Uh, so, um, FinCom um, <laughs> uh, has uh, mostly, you know, finished up. They're, they're, they're buttoning up. They're looking forward to their last um, coordination, or not, not the next coordination meeting with us. Um, their the Municipal Facilities Committee uh, is doing a number of studies, one of which is a site study for the VPW because we've got a lot of issues there that um, the contract for um, TBA architects uh, for the feasibility study for the police department has been signed and there should be work starting on that to, to develop a plan so that uh, we'll bring that, you know, that'll be on the warrant. Uh, we'll have more better. It won't be a, a tight number, but it'll be a better you know. So should that be added? It's in there. Oh, it is? Uh, yeah. It's, uh, we only just went through the list. And I, I know, it's in it. here. It was, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's in the capital projects. The, oh, uh, it was in know. the section we, we yes. skipped over. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, what else? Uh, Long-term caps um, is working, and uh, we've reduced that budget. Fairly, you know, a couple of places, and and it's almost finished to be and almost ready to be given to the FinCom so that they can put it in their budget so they can present it to you. Okay, Carrie. Nothing here, uh, Mr. Chairman. Oh, well, how formal. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman. All right. Oh, oh, one last thing. Um, <coughs> the um. um Carlo Housing Trust uh, wanted to recommend uh, two people, Maureen Deary and George. Uh, forget his last name. No, not George. Um, Maureen Deary and um, Jonathan Stevens to be appointed um, as members. Can we put that on the agenda? Yeah, we put that on the agenda. Actually, been on this week because they thought they were they were here because they thought they were going to be appointed tonight. No, we're just wasting their time. Yeah. We'll get it on the next one. Okay. Yeah, and if we could maybe do an executive session for the Chiefs contract. Yeah, let's do an executive session yeah. for Chiefs contract too. Yeah, we'll get that on. Um, Did you want a copy of the report, the deer? 
Did you have a yes. you want a paper copy? Yeah. yeah. We're just gonna end up tossing ours. Oh. Here we got a couple. Yeah. Do you mind yeah, if I give I've got more I've got one too if you want I it. Right one here. Also. Well, let's say. Yeah. It's on the deer committee. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cool. Okay, so minutes from January 8th. Oh, um, those are the ones. I um, have um, submitted a fairly substantial edit, and what I would like to do is have these um, the motion action on this. You want us to minutes discuss to it next time? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, we do have um, 30 so days or three meetings, whichever is longer. And since I won't be making the next meeting, would it be okay to put it on what, the 26th? Yeah, the meeting that's, of the 26th? That's fine with me. But uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you're going to edit them, do it in red line so that we can all yeah. see what you edited. Okay. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. All right. Is there anything further? Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, adjourn. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Here. Reed Eye. <laughs> Brown Eye. Oscar Lowe. Lewis Eye. All right. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Excellent. Pretty good. Bad. Yeah. We're in 10 minutes. Yeah.